Hello, hello, Danger Needles. I am here with uh, an SCP researcher. <laughs> I'm not wrong. I feel like Dr. Radler, well, would be technically a researcher, is more akin to a doctor. <laughs> Like a medical doctor, not like a research doctor. Yeah. I mean, I've literally put that he also does SCP research in the, his story, so I can't deny it. But I feel like that's not saying his main job. Yeah. All right. And hello, Robin. Well, everyone. Would be also akin to a snake in a trench coat. Wait, what? Robin says Dr. Rattler would be would be also akin to a snake in a trench coat. No, Dr. Indigo Rattler is not a snake in a trench coat. <laughs> there are very specific times where he is a snake. Yeah. Otherwise, he's people. Yes. Anyways, ready to hear the first story? Unlike the, the others, this one is short. I plan to do a rather long stream today. <laughs> as far as we know, this right. But anyways, everyone ready? Are you ready, Robin? I don't know why, but every time I go to look at my chat, my model just looks like I'm displeased with my chat. I'm not sure what to tell you. <laughs> Alright. <laughs> Anyways. Alright. <clears throat> ashes, ashes. We all fall down. What do you cure, exactly? The fluorescent lights were, as always, buzzing. The table between the two individuals was about three feet across and made of painted white metal. The small white room had one door in and out, with an empty observation room connected via a large glass window pane. SCP-049 and SCP-343 both sat in chairs on opposite ends of the table. SCP-049 looked around in a, in a panic before speaking. What are you? A seeker of truth, a deliverer of mysteries. So what do you cure exactly? SCP-049 leaned in slightly. The Pestilence. SCP-343 chuckled. Of course. You always say the Pestilence like it's some grand truth. If it was so self-evident, why is it everyone asks you the same question? I do not know. Pestilence is responsible for more death and destruction than any other disease afflicting this world. Right, but you can't tell me what it is, can you? I do not feel a need to do so. You can't. If you could, you would have. Or you would have told someone else. But not once have you named your boogeyman anything else that the pe that the pestilence. I do not have the time nor inclination to banter with whoever you are. I must return to my experiments. Your experiments will still be there when I'm done learning about you. But since we're talking about them... Why do you kill people? I do not. 
I cured him with the Great Pestilence, and... No. You kill people. Let's be clear about that, at least. Though you've killed many less since the Foundation put you in, into a box. The pestilence is nearly eradicated here. Doctors, the guards, all clean of infection. SCP-343 leaned back in his chair and laced his hands behind his head. You know what? I think it's free will. What? I mean, it could be life itself. It could be an actual disease that only you can see. But I'd guess it's free will. I do not understand. No, you wouldn't. To be free of it yourself, you, you'd have to excise it. Cut it out and never return to it. Tell me. Why did you kill Dr. Ham? He was your friend. I had no choice. He was infected. He... He was thinking about retiring. His daughter was about to go off to college. And he wanted to take some time off. Maybe quit entirely. You killed him as soon as he stopped blindly following orders. As soon as he chose something that his superiors at the Foundation didn't choose for him. You are confused. I have always done what must be done without regard for my personal feelings. I'm not confused. I was there when you were made. What? Things like you. They crop up in dark places where I can't always look. But it was sunny that day. Hot. The stink carried for miles. I don't... Stop. And SCP-049 froze in place. The room around them fell away until they were standing in a sunny green field next to a road. A man was gathering sticks and wood that had fallen from sparse trees that were sprinkled across the landscape. The faint sound of hooves on dirt echoed in the distance. SCP-343 pointed at the man gathering the sticks. Is... is that you? SCP-049 turned his head to look. He couldn't move the rest of his body, but he could move his head and eyes. He tried to speak, but the words didn't come. The man gathering sticks was wearing what could comfortably be called rags. He was placing the sticks in a pile on his wheelbarrow. The beating hooves got closer. This is where you, this is where you became a monster. It's subtle. Watch closely. The moment you chose to change is coming up. The horse in the distance was finally upon them. It was pale gray with black spots along its neck. Atop it sat a man in the protective garb of a plague doctor. He was slumped in the, mis in the saddle as he passed and fell with a thud to the ground. The horse stopped as the rider fell. The man in, in, with the sticks ran over to help. Give me one moment. Hey, Gooch. Gooch. Come here. Oh, God. Alright. Alright, let me continue. SCP-343 spoke up. He's sick. Same thing that's killing everyone else in your village. He's come here to make some money off the dying and the dead. But he's about to join them. The man with the sticks pulled the mask off the man. The man beneath it almost immediately vomited blood onto the ground beside them. He rolled over and tried to crawl away. He knows he's infected. He knows he's putting you at risk. 
He doesn't know you're immune. A quirk of genetics you probably still wouldn't understand. What makes you one of the luckiest members of your generation? Watch this. He is about to die, and you're about to make a great a decision. The actual, the actual doctor collapsed to the ground. The man with the sticks looked at the mask in his hands, and he put it on. If you were almost anyone else, you would be dead in less than a week. Instead, you have an idea. You're going to make some money. You're going to feed your family off a of farce. The man with the sticks crawled over to the fallen man and began to remove his robes, then looked up at the horse. Then the scene faded away, and a swirling of events unfolded around them. You ride the horse, carrying death with you as you go. Castle to castle, town to town, village to village, house to house, until you've made a grand circuit. You are home. You have enough money to last several lifetimes. You and your family will never go hungry again. The scene solidified again. The man sat on a pale horse overlooking a village. Several of the shacks were on fire. The stench of death filled it, the air. SCP-343 nodded. And the scene shifted again. There in the town. The man in the Plague Doctor costume rushed to a single house. Your family is in there, aren't they? Your wife? Your daughter? The man walked into the house. The smell of rotten flesh was overpowering. A woman lay dead on the floor. Chunks had been taken out of her arms and legs. Animals. The man fell to his knees. He cried out. And a noise in the dark corner of the house stirred him from his grief. You left them here to fend for themselves. No warning. You couldn't take the risk. This is what the money bought you. A young girl moved out of the shadows and looked up at the plague doctor. He recoiled as he saw her face covered in blood. She was dragging something behind her. She's just like you. Shares your quirk. She couldn't get sick. The scene faded out to gray. The white interview room came back. The buzzing of the fluorescent lights returned. And the plague doctor moved his hands again. SCP-049 cocked his head to the side. I do not know those people. I am... SCP-343 raised a hand. I understand now. There are darker, darker places that even I cannot see, and things like you come out of the darkness. I was wrong. You've never once made a choice that was yours. You're just an echo of a man. Go back to your room. I... SCP-343 disappeared from the room in a flash of light. SCP-343 sighed and thought about who he wanted to question next. And that's it. Oh, sorry about the hand signals. Uh. All right. All right. Okay. You know what, Sarah? Oh, God. What, have, what else should you do after reading about the great pestilence and death besides a peace sign? Yeah. Yeah. If you couldn't tell... Um, Gooch came in the room. Yeah, so I had to put him on my lap, because he, he was trying to, to eat my trash can. <laughs> yeah. Anyways. But yeah, that's... A version of the origin story to the Plague Doctor. Hmm. What do you think about that? The 
first thing I think of, I've always thought of the doctor. Honestly, this isn't the first time I heard of the, heard the story. Hmm. Anyways, hopefully, uh, Gooch won't interrupt the next story. <laughs> but are we ready to hear the expiratory log, the SCP-354? Just a warning. There may be triggering things in it, such as blood and gore, like, I think badly. I, I can't remember when I last read it. It's definitely a not, not a new story, so I don't blame you. Yeah. Let's just say adult story, uh, warning, uh, Content. E. E. Anyways. <clears throat> Exploratory Mission 354 Alpha. Personal log of Dr. Redacted. Our expedition to explore SCP-354, that gaping wound in the middle of Canada, has finally been accepted. The R&D boys have come up with what can only be described as a submarine with a drill on it. We know that the pool gets denser as you go down, so we suspect that at some point we won't be sinking so much as digging. Hence the huge mining device built onto it. It's not hydrodynamic at all, but we're not going, we're not really going swimming here. My gut tells me that there's something on the other side of the red pool. And just like digging down, up, to China, all we have to do is dig down or up to it. Personal Log of Dr. Redacted Had a nice long debate with O5 Redacted over who's allowed to come. I wanted... MTF Omega-7 to come with us for protection, or at least SCP-076, but they won't allow it. Despite the massive damages he continues to cause, they still see him as too valuable to risk losing. Not that he isn't, you know, immortal or anything. Maybe they just didn't have the guts to ask him to go exploring. Eckler, that ass... Wanted us to take SCP Redacted with us, but I wouldn't allow it. The file says SCP Redacted was just born before he came through, so he'd be a useless as a guide. He might be of some use as security, but that's mostly cancelled out by the fact that he's data expunged. He probably just redacted anyway. The final crew complement part for myself consists of three agents. Two D-class personnel, one geologist, and some guy from R&D who's going to pilot the ship. I already forgot all of their names. Exploratory Team 354-Alpha, ETA 354-A, Mission Log, Day 1. Rotten sort of day to begin a mission. Rumor has it that last night there was a to total containment breach in some area or n or other. Then it turns out that there's no coffee allowed anywhere inside of Area 354 for some reason or another. The whole mission almost ended in disaster 
when it turns out that they almost forgot to load the extra fuel on board. Who the fuck is running the show around here? Anyway, we're now underway. For a while there, I had definite feeling of going downward. But now, we're dropping much more slowly. Marty, that's the R&D guy's name. Says we're sinking at a rate of 10 meters an hour. Apparently, at this depth, the red pool is pretty damn dense. Alright. Give me a moment, Danger Needles. <sighs> Dude! I'll be back, Danger Needles. Huge. Sorry about that, Danger Noodles. I'm back. Welcome back. All right, I'll continue reading off after day one. <clears throat> ETA ET 354A mission log day two. Nothing of interest happened, but I learned everyone's names. We have Marty, our pilot, Agent Swanson, Agent Turquoise, Agent 86, Dr. MacArthur, Chris Simmons, and Leroy Tucker. Whoop de frickin' do. ET-354A, Mission Log, Day 3. At about 4.30 a.m., gravity suddenly changed direction. Boy, that was a fun way to wake up. We're now rising rather than sinking, which means we're more than halfway there. ET-354A, Mission Log, Day 4. We reach the surface, through the portholes, it's mostly dark, which means it's night. We can't go out yet because, for all we know, the atmosphere could be hydrochloric acid. We all, we've got a shitload of sensors outside the ship analyzing a bunch of stuff. Whether the air is breathable. What kinds of airborne bacteria we have to deal with. And simple stuff like temperature. We'll know in 8 hours whether it's safe for human life out there. ET-354, Mission Log, Day 5. Turns out the air is totally safe. Except it, it's been night for going on 28 hours now. What's going on? ET-354A, Mission Log, Day 6. Dawn finally came. The sun was huge and red. I'm a biologist. But I know enough about astronomy to know that we're orbiting a totally different star. Is this a different time, a different place, or a different dimension? Leroy suggests that we're in a, another plane of existence. And I think he's probably closest. The 
people on this side is way bigger. More like a large pond or maybe a small lake. The banks are more defined than on our si on our side as well. We took an inflatable raft to the shore. Marty and Simmons stayed behind and headed north. The ground here, or at least around the pool, is almost totally devoid of plant life. The only green we saw was a sort of fuzzy moss growing on the ground that looked more like a kind of mold. The ground is grayish tan dirt. That's like a mixture of sand and flour. MacArthur said it was some mineral or another. But I forgot what he called it. I half expected all of our electronics to not work out here. But that wasn't the fir uh, first thing to fail. After about two hours of hiking across flat, boring ground, the compass suddenly changed direction. Now it points to what we had previously thought to be east. Evidently, this place, planet's ma magnetics, is it even a planet? Don't work the same way ours do. Not wanting to ri risk getting lost, we immediately made a 180 and headed back to the ship. I could have sworn that the trip was less than half as long as the trip out. Tomorrow we'll work out a way of navigation that doesn't rely on the compass being sane. ET-354A Mission Log Day 7 Lousy night's sleep. The sun never went down. By my calculations, the day slash night cycle here seems to last about 43 and a half hours as opposed to 24 hours back home. It's going to take some getting used to. We agreed on a system of navigation. Firstly, we're going to travel only in a straight line to make sure that we can get back to the ship by simply turning around and heading in the other direction. Unless we encounter some kind of unnavigable jungle, we should be fine. Secondly, Mark Marty has rigged the radio beacon thing. I don't really remember his explanation. But if we're somewhere within 800 miles, this little gizmo will be able to tell us exactly which direction to go to get back and how far. ET-354A, Mission Log, Day 9. We set out for... Out a few hours before the sun was scheduled to rise, but when we got to the shore, we found that the green moss stuff was everywhere. It had grown in mass significantly. My guess is the scuff shrivels, shrivels up in the sun during the day and expands at night to suck in nutrients or something. We decided we did not want to walk through it, so we went back and waited for sunrise. Sun came up and we set out again. Moss stuff was back t to its smaller state. It, it just occurred to me that there, there's there been no wind at all in this place. The result is dead silence. I'm not ashamed to admit that the overall emptiness of this place is pretty scary. We found an area with none of the moss stuff for, f for a few hundred feet around. And decided to camp for the night. The sun is still up, but it's time for us humans to sleep, so I'm calling it night. ET-354A, Mission Log, Day 10. Sometime in the night, which was really daytime, fuck, this is going to be get confusing. We were all awoken by some kind of roar. You remember what the T-Rex sounded in, in that old movie Jurassic Park. It sounded a lot like that. Big and reptilian. It was so loud that I was certain. Whatever was making it couldn't be more than 20 feet away. But when we all got out of our tents, we didn't see anything. The whole area is so flat that we see any sort of animal within half a mile or so. But there was nothing fucking scary. 
We packed up camp and continued on. After a while, we stopped seeing the moss stuff. Maybe it only grows around the red pool. And the ground became rockier. In the distance, the land seems to grow more hilly. I think I see trees. ET-354A, Mission Log, Day 11. The bare ground has ended. Now we're walking across a vast field of beautiful green grass. It almost looks like a well-mown lawn. The grass seems ordinary enough until turquoise tripped over a rock and arose to find his hands covered in several dozen bloody pinpricks. Apparently the tip of the blade of this grass is incredibly sharp and easily punctures skin. It's no threat to our foundation issue boots, but we must all be careful not to fall on it. We came to a tiny stream, really no more than a, than a trickle. Someone suggested we should refill our canteens, but Leroy and MacArthur wanted to check the water for something or other first. MacArthur took out some equipment and after a few minutes announced that it was not water, but liquid carbon dioxide. CO2 is usually a gas at this temperature, and, and it's never a liquid. The laws of physics don't seem to be working right. ET-354A, Mission Log, Day 14. Haven't had time to record anything for a few days. We made it to an area sparsely populated by trees. The grass there was withered and brown and not sharp enough to pierce the skin anymore. The trees were ordinary, looked like birch, but the leaves were wrong. At some point we lost Swanson. This place is so quiet that none of us really feel comfortable talking, so we have no idea when we lost him. There's a good eight hour window where he could have gone missing. We called him, but none of us wanted to split up look to look for him. During the night, a tree fell on 86's tent. He wasn't hurt and none of his gear was damaged, although the tent got mangled beyond repair. A6 swears that the tree had been that close when he pitched the thing, and none of us can tell what caused it to fall. The trunk just snapped. We all agreed not to pitch our tents anywhere near a tree from now on. The next day, which was really nighttime, we heard the same roar from a few days ago. It sounded exactly the same as before, and again, we have no idea what made the sound, and none of us can even agree which direction it came from. When it started the rain, we all pitched our tents for the night, this time a whole lot closer together than we had before. The nearest tree was about 300 feet away. MacArthur confirmed that it's actually rain and not more CO2 bullshit. And we set up this funnel thing to refill our canteens. Leroy donated his tent to Agent 86 and offered to share mine. Since it's a little bigger than the other guys, I asked Leroy what he did to wind up as a D-class. He, he said he raped a couple of people. I think he might have been trying to freak me out, but who knows. Anyway, he's most well-behaved D-class I've ever met. So I don't think he's going to, to say, assault me in my sleep. ET-354A, Mission Log, Day 17. Good God, the rain has finally stopped. Everything is soaking wet, including us, except for the ground. After not much water, you expect it to be muddy as all hell. But the ground beneath the grass is barely damp at all. Perhaps the plants have stored the moisture from the ground more efficiently than the ones back home. We're setting out again. Perhaps the rain awakened some animal life. Data corrupt. Scion Log Day 25. Seemed to be a huge cliff in the distance turned out to be an artificially constructed wall. It's made of, s of solid rusty iron and it stands maybe 50 feet high. To the left and to the right it goes on further than the eye can see. I can't imagine how thick it is. We have no way around it. We have no way to go over it or through it. We made camp for the night. 
You'll work out what to do in the morning. ET-354A, Mission Log, Day 26. Leroy jury rigged some kind of blowtorch thing with our equipment. I swear, this guy is fucking MacGyver. We cut a hole in the iron wall big enough for us to go through. It turns out it's only about a quarter of an inch thick, but there's another wall behind it with less than a foot between. Apparently this thing has multiple layers. Leroy cut through eight of them before we made it to the other side. The grass on this side is black. Not burnt or anything, it's just a different color. And finally there's some wind. I was getting tired of data corrupt. Included that coming here was a mistake. We have to turn back. ET-354A, Mission Log, Day 39. We passed through the second barrier, and we're back in a weird place with black grass. I half expected the whole Leroy cut through it to have sealed up or something, but it was still there. Thank God, or whoever runs the, the, the show in this world. I don't think MacArthur is going to make it through the night. He lost a lot of blood. ET-354A, Mission Log, Day 40. We awoke to find that MacArthur had crossed. We didn't want to do it, but we had no choice but to terminate him. 86 said that something back home might have, might be able to help him, and he may have been right, but we couldn't afford to have him slow us down. We only have a few days until data corrupt. A48. We made it back to the ship with only an hour or two to spare. The first thing they asked us was what the fuck happened to Swanson, Turquoise, MacArthur, and 86. As if a few dead team members are our biggest problems right now. Marty has us underway and we're definitely sinking. I just hope they don't data corrupt. End of log. This document was discovered in the Central Foundation database. No such mission to explore SCP-354 has yet been suggested or approved. No records of any personnel mentioned in this log exist. The log's origin is unknown. And that is the exploration log of SCP-354. Anyways, well, I, I wonder what you guys think about it, but I'll be right back because I need to go get a drink. Is everybody ready to hear the next story? Everyone ready? I'm just going to assume everyone's ready.
I'm so sorry for my sniffles. I think I got a cold. Lord Blackwood and the Bigfoot. July 3rd, 1857. It has been better part of a year since I set sail from England. I feel myself overcome with a certain melancholy every time I watch the white cliffs of Dover disappear over the horizon, seemingly watching me as I venture out into the wilderness. But whatever guilt I might feel, there is much work to be done. The vast untamed wilds of the world wait for no man. And it is our duty as Englishmen to carry the light of civilization to the corners of creation. Today I have alighted in the Oregon Territory in a newly founded town on the shores of Puget Sound that the pioneers call Seattle. Even now, in the height of summer, is a cold and dreary place. Clouds meander across the heavens, bringing showers and fog as cool winds blow across the water. And on all signs, sides of this tiny town, is surrounded by the massive evergreens that populate this, count, this country. In many ways, it's not like it's not unlike the climate of my boyhood home in the West Country. And I felt an odd sense of nostalgia as the summer rains wet my cheek. But it is not the town, nor the weather that interests me. It is the force that hold my true reason for venturing to this virgin frontier. In, in the town, I have hired porters and two guides a white man and a civilized Indian. I spent many hours in conversation with the noble redskin, which confirmed the legends I had heard repeated third hand in the gentleman's club back on Broad Street. In the unexplored woods east of the sound, so the Indians said, they lived a race of primates known to, to science. Half again, as tall as a man, covered head to toe, and thick fur, quick and nimble, possessing an almost manlike cleverness. Sasquatch, my guide, called the creatures, but they have been called by many names by the tribe he knew of. Semiqui, Momo, Kiwiki, Spookum, and Bigfoot among them. Even among the Indians, they were most regarded as little more than legend. But my guide informed me that he had seen one in the flesh two years prior. In the foothills of the mountain, These his people called Tamaha. And he, heard, he had heard tales of a tribe that worshipped them as gods. Tomorrow we set off to the Homa, where it is a... Where it, it is Bigfoot that I seek now as my quarry. I mean to find one of the elusive beasts and bring it back to England. Dead if I must, alive if I can. I have brought ample equipment from England and purchased fresh victuals from the shops in town. Tonight I plan and I pray that my hunt will not fail. July 7th, 1857. The force of the territory make for slow going. In my adventures, I have hacked through jungle reeds, forced my way through the tall grasses of the Serengeti, braved the unforgiving cold of the Himalayas, and baked under the cruel Egyptian sun. But what hand or blade can cast aside the trunks of the ancient evergreens that stand by the myriads 
in every direction. The guys assure me that we are making steady progress, though it seems we have gone scarcely two dozen miles since we left Se Seattle. I caught my first glimpse of Tahoma today as we entered a clearing upon a hill, and I was overwhelmed by the beauty of the tableau that I observed. Tahoma is not clearly the height of the famous peak XV that Sir Wow described the last year in Nepal. But unlike the Great Himalayas, it stands alone, a solitary peak towering above the forest of the, the territory. Like a proud and mighty king surveying a kingdom, encompassing all that it perceives. Shortly after midday, we, we chance upon a fox cub, scarcely old enough to hunt for itself, imprisoned in a cage of wood and hides. My Indian guide pointed out a clever set of machinations connected to the box, informing me that it was a trap laid by the Indians who lived in those woods, and that the unfortunate rascal had been lured in by a scrap of meat and to be captured. He said to me that his people were most efficient. The beast's hide would make clothing, its teeth jewelry, its meat food for children, its new cords and rope. Let alone, let there be no doubt, any who may chance to read this, that I with glee engaged in many a fox hunt in the county pastures in my younger days. But to ride out with one's hounds is a gentleman's game. In this, my friend, there was no sport. I looked in the creature's eyes, and it seemed to regard me almost as a starving beggar child might regard a man of wealth. Envious and jealous, but at the same time supplicant, as if to beg me for mercy. I drew my knife and cut the cords holding the cage door shut, and a vulpine burst free and darted into the woods, fetching a grief glance at me as it ran away. July 8th. 1857. This morning we encountered a half dozen Indians in a hunting party near the banks of a river. I had thought at first to call it the Blackwood River when we forded it, though my guide informed me it was known to his people as Nisqually. The Indians regarded us at first with suspicion. I know not if they had seen a white man before, and I feared the worst. But my Indian called out to them in a language strange to me, and he responded gleefully in the same. I learned that he was one of the was of the same tribe as they, and that he called their leader his cousin, and they received us warmly. We luncheoned on salmon that the Indians had caught in the river and traded them for Bigfoot, uh, traded them for food and supplies. I was most excited to hear from one of the younger uh, younger Indians that he had seen a Bigfoot once when he was young, for the porters believed this expedition to be a fool's errand, and with this revelation they seemed most renewed in their vig vigors. By the time we parted ways, I managed to learn a few words of their language. After I had brought a Bigfoot back to England, I shall have to return to this land and learn more of the ways of these people. July 13th, 1857 I write in haste, for my captors have not discovered this book. I am in, the dark I am in darkness alone. My feet bound in a tent in a place I do not know. Well guarded by my captors. They came upon us two nights ago. We had encamped in a night in a clearing not a dozen miles from from the place my Indian told me he had 
seeing the Bigfoot two years hence. They must have been lurking in the darkness for hours, and came upon the Chief Porter unawares when he stood the night watch before I could reach my rifle all I all but one of the porters and my Indian guide had been felled by the brutes. Arrows and hatchets. I took two of the bastards in reply with my rifle and four more with my pistol before one of them grabbed me from behind and knocked me out. When I awoke, I had been tied to a pole and two of the Bigfoots were carrying me deeper into the woods. I could see my Indian and the last surviving porter being carried somewhere. I called out to my, my Indian and he told me that he recognized our captors as a tribe that had been ancient enemies of his own. They were unrepentant pagans and cannibals. He told me they worshipped a strange god that lived in the mountain. It was said they raided the villages and other tribes for sacrifices to offer to their god Shirley. He said we had been chosen to fill this wondrous duty. It is very cold here. Though the sun shines brightly through the trees at midday, I know not whether the Indians have my weapons or not. I pray that they do. For if I cannot reach them, I will surely perish in this wilderness. July 16th, 1857. Words cannot express the terror I have beheld this day. The Indians have brought us to their home camp in the foothills. Even now, in the midst of summer, clumps of snow congregate under the rocks and at the base of the trees. At midday, the three of us escorted to a snowy clearing at the edge of the vast wood climbing up the mountain. Hundreds of Indians formed a half circle around the clearing, and our porter was loosed from his bounds and dragged to the center. One of the savages began beating upon a massive drum and singing in bizarre language, the likes of which I have never learned, uh, never heard. Others joined in, and the forest were filled with a din of a thousand screaming Indians. Suddenly, the trees at the edge of the clearing seemed to rustle. And part way in the throng's silence as it emerged. Bigfoot in the flesh. The tails had not done the beast justice. It stood fifteen feet if it stood an inch, and it could not have weighed less than a half half a ton, a long ton. I could scarcely discern its continuance beneath its matted fur, and it covered its face, ravenous, primal. Caked in blood and spittle. It bore the scars of many struggles. And, praying that the reader will forgive my lack of modesty, displayed its manhood proudly. It set its eyes on a porter and charged at him with a speed I would not have expected from a brute of its size. The porter made to run, but the Indians closed in upon him and allowed him no aggress. Within seconds, the beast was upon him. I could hardly bear to look as it ripped him limb from limb, its yellow sharpened teeth tearing into his flesh, his blood running down its jaws as it greedily feasted upon him. The Indians returned to me, returned me to the tent afterward. I fear I am next. July nineteenth, eighteen fifty-seven. I hope by now, should anyone be reading this years hence, that you regard me as an honest man throughout my many years, exploring the unknown corners of the world. I have considered it my obligation to tell no less than the whole truth regarding my discoveries. Yet my fellow countrymen might know the world that lies beyond the borders of our great empire, and prepare for the day when the light of the goodliness and peace shines around the world. 
I say this now for the events I must now recount. It might seem a, a fantasy to you, dear reader. Indeed, I would find it difficult to believe myself had I not seen it with my own eyes. But on my sacred honor as an Englishman, I assure you that every word of it is true. On the afternoon of the 17th, the Indians offered my Indian guide as a sacrifice to Bigfoot, as they had my porter. Yesterday, the 18th, they prepared to do the same to me. I spent the morning in solemn prayer and reflection. For the first time in my life, I understood the sorrow of a condemned man awaiting the hangman's noose. I felt I had lived a good life, and I was prepared to do what any good Englishman would to meet my maker with a stiff upper lip and a quaint, plain conscience. The Indians led me to the clearing and loosened my bonds. I strode calmly into the center of the clearing and closed my eyes. If I was about to die, I intended to die with my dignity intact. The drumming and the screaming started. I heard the trees rustle as Bigfoot drew near to claim his meal, but it was not Bigfoot's approach that silenced the savages. Rather, I heard a distant yet remarkable Remarkably near the howl of a fox. Muffled chatter arose from, from the throng as a second howl answered the first. Soon a third animal was howling, and before long the woods were alive with a cockafy. Not only foxes, but I heard the howls of wolves and screeching of hawks and falcons. The roar of the mountain cats, even the calls of pigeons. I opened my eyes as a hundred animals or more emerged from the woods and set upon the Indians. I beheld foxes and wolves, elk and deer, gulls and eagles, bears and raccoons side by side like a cavalry charge as they knocked the wild men to the ground and tore out their throats. Every one of the creatures ran past me, barely darting their eyes their eyes my way as I beheld the sight. Some even seemed to have markings on their brows, like the war paint the Indians themselves have decorated with. I decided to take advantage of the opportunity and ran. Neither man nor beast made any attempt to stop me, as I made for the, for the west, away from Tahoma and Bigfoot, towards the sea and hopefully some sign of civilization. By nightfall, I had easily put ten miles between myself and the camp, but alone, hungry, bruised, and exhausted, and in the dark, I could go no further and curled up by a tree to sleep. When I woke this morning, I found myself surrounded by wild beasts. Half a dozen deer stood in a semicircle before me, paint on their faces, their horns and coats covered with Indian blood, and two raccoons in the center. I panicked when I first saw them and excitedly tried to reach for my gun for fear they had come to finish me off. They stepped back in unison when they saw me startle and I saw that one of the deer upon its back was carrying a large bundle. My own possessions, scavenged from the remains of my camp. The creature knelt to the ground and shrugged, letting it fall to the ground and I eagerly examined it. Much of what I brought to the woods was gone, but my rifle was intact my pistol and a tent and alcohol for which to clean my cuts and scrapes and enough dried rations to last two weeks time. I barely had to ponder this miracle before the rest of the animals fell to their knees as well and opened a path between them. A fox approached me, old weather bearing signs of having seen more winters than most of its kind do. It bore an air of a poor air of dignity about it, and one rarely seems from such creatures as it approached me and stood before me, it seemed to examine me carefully, contemplating as it looked me over before it uttered a low bark, and one of the raccoons approached me. I noticed now something I had overworked before. Raccoon head tied to its back with a thin piece of twine. A rolled piece of paper. The fox gestured to the paper with his nose. 
and I reached down and drew the paper free. I unrolled it and found a handwritten message in English, which I present to you below. We, Alaric the Fifth, by the grace of God, King of all the forests, Lord of the plains, Duke of the Grand Fur and Underground, Undergrowth, Count of the Swamp, Margrave of the Nameless Mountain, Warden of all streams and rivers, and Lord Protector of the Tribes of Man, Defender of the Faith, recognize you as a fellow Christian and a civilized man. Grateful for your rescue to our royal issue from the devious machinations of the pagan Indians. Thankful that your kind has have returned to this land. Helpful that you will, on our behalf, deliver news to your homeland that Christendom shall have in these parts a steadfast ally. Acknowledging that in rescuing you from the false god of the pagans, we are responsible for your welfare and safe passage in our lands. Do hereby on this day, the 19th day of the 7th month, in the year of our Lord, 1857, bestow upon you the rank of Knight Commander of the Order of the Thristle, Thistle, with all the privileges and responsibility of that office. Command you to, from the day forward, act as a loyal servant of Christ in his church, Catholic and Apostolic, as long as you shall live. In charge, you return to the lands of Christendom, very news of our kingdom, and return with an embassy for the negotiation of amicable communication between our nations. To this document, we affix our seal in sacred and royal. The paper had been signed, so to say, with an ink stamp, what I assumed to have been the fox's paw print. I looked down at the creature who I now saw regarded me with a gaze almost human in its wisdom. It raised his right paw to touch its forehead and lowered it to his chest and shoulders, making the sign of a cross. I repeated the chester and it nodded to me. Having apparently reached an agreement, the fox that called itself a lyric of the fifth turned and strode away into the woods, its motley ratoon following behind. September 7th, 1857. It has been over a month since I made my escape from the forest and entered my convalescence here in Seattle. I wandered five days in the woods and might be wandering still. If not for that by chance, I found the same friendly tribe of Indians I had met on the banks of Nisqually two weeks before. With what bits of their language I knew, I tried to tell them of our encounter with the Indian, other Indians, the Bigfoot and a strange group of animals that had been my salvation. I know not if they understand, understood me, or if they merely thought me mad. But a small group of them traveled north with me and led me back to town, where I have rested and healed my wounds since. It is too late in a year to attempt another expedition in search of the Bigfoot. I am told that the winter in these parts is long and cold, and that it will be April before another expedition to the foothills is advisable. In any event, I have a little money left with which to hire anyone, I have sent a letter south to San Francisco to be telegraphed to the Royal Society in London, containing an account of my findings and a request for financing to launch a proper expedition into this wilderness, whether to capture Bigfoot or establish an embassy with a strange nation of the Fox King Alaric. Bearing disaster, I expect a reply by Christmas. I do not hold much hope that they will assent to such a proposition. After all, I am the only witness to these fantastical events, and the only evidence the declaration of knighthood granted me by the fox will not be in London for several years or more. 
Perhaps I shall leave this territory entirely when the next ship arrives in May and set out for other parts unknown. I heard before I left London that the White Raja in Borneo has required a strange machine that fell from the sky. Who knows what other wonders might lurk in the Javanese jungles waiting to be shown the light of day by one such as myself. And that is the end of that story. I'm not sure if anyone can tell, but uh, I had to do some censorship. Because <laughs> a, a certain word was said a couple times. That starts the letter S. I replaced it with Indians. Hey, like I can get what word that is. Yeah, <laughs> I just, I replaced it. <laughs> Saxophones is definitely a first word. Yeah. Let's just say it's a word a modern person would not say. The character in the story is not remotely modern, though. You're not supposed to like the character because he's a person of their time, we'll say. Yeah. But not really dislike them. You'll kind of dislike them, but I think that's part of the point. Uh, so isn't Lord Blackwood an SCP? It's either Lord Blackwood or something with the memories of Lord Blackwood. They don't really know for sure. But the SCP is convinced they're Lord Blackwood and convinced they're human. They're not human. We do not know if they are actually yeah. Lord Blackwood. Yeah. Yeah, they're a neon slug. But yeah, Nuri, Nuri, Kia, we don't know if the slug is actually Lord Blackwood, but they're convinced they're Lord Blackwood. We do not know for sure, but that is, that is hilarious, the idea of the slug going through that, but I think be it they were originally human, or they have the memories of a human, I'm pretty sure Lord Blackwood was human when they went through those adventures. Yeah. There are definitely parts where slugs would not be able to do it. Yeah, I was I I was reading, I was like, how many times is it gonna say it? <laughs> well back then that was a common word to say. Yeah, there, there was, there was also one thing I wasn't. Sh I I also censored. Um, cause I wasn't sure if it was a bad thing to say. I, I was just sent it to you, Jerry, because I wasn't sure. All right. It's in DMs. Yeah, that's also a racist old term that people used a lot back then. Okay, I wasn't sure, so I just censored it anyways. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, considering you're not, not part Native American, I get not being sure. But yeah, that was a super racist term back then. Yeah. I mean, nope. it's still racist. It's just people use it less besides one person who decided... That liter even though literally everyone else wants to change the team's name, they do not want to change the team's name, and it belongs to them. <laughs> yeah, the football team. <laughs> I think, uh, I think they, yeah, I think they used to be my state's football team, but they got kicked out. <laughs> they went to another state. Well, at your head, we're talking about some of the words that Bright omitted because you know. 
he's reading a Lord Blackwood story. And we know Lord Blackwood was a British man of his time and said slightly racist terms about Native Americans. Would you like a, a, a DM of those terms? <laughs> yeah, anyways, hi, Hatchet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame the swearing of what did I just walk in? Yeah. Also, for this story at the end, there is an audio log. Oh? Yeah. So, do you want me to tell you those uh, terms in a in in a message, private message hatchet, or <laughs> or no, the the racist omitted term. Can I ha going to have you on on in the background while I work on overways? Okay. Uh, what's my okay, favorite? Okay, well, let's just say the the first word starts with S, and there's a Disney move a Disney song that literally has the term as the title. And the other is another iffy term concerning Native Americans that a baseball team is still using. A uh, football team. I thought it was a baseball team. No, it's in the NFL. <laughs> it's a football team. Hmm. Yeah, Washington. I'm not going to finish the rest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair. Okay. Football then, okay. <laughs> I'm not kidding for myself. Uh, what's my favorite SCP? Okay, that's actually a tough one. I thought it was six ten. Um, it's a three way tie, because I've because the SVT listing. I've been reading more SCPs. It's a bit of a tie between six ten, three five four. Out. Oh, I am. Oh, God damn it. Anyways, I'm back. Um, it's a bit of a tie between three anomalies. Um, SCP 354, 610, and I forgot its number, but it's a joke SCP where it's it's making fun of what's the worst that can possibly happen. Except it's a phrase, the more you say it, the worse the event gets. Oh. Yeah, even though it's a joke, it is extremely dangerous. And could be a reality ender. <laughs> oh. oh. I actually don't have a fa uh, favorite series, I can't, or a favorite series thing. Uh, a favorite se a canon event is this is Jack Bright <laughs> killing 682 with a chainsaw cannon. <laughs> that happened in one universe. <laughs> Why is that a thing? <laughs> Anyways, we read. I miss. I miss speaking Victor. Yeah. All right. Time to read the we next. We have our different favorites. <laughs> all right. Time to read the next SCP. This is about. This is a story about SP three thousand, Anastasia. I'm still wondering how I can say Anastasia's correctly, but I can't say some words words that are simple correctly. Well, sometimes when you hear a word that's very complicated, it never leaves your mind like a weird groove key. Anastasia. Yes, it's a giant... I, I, if I remember correctly, I think it's a giant eel-like serpent near the Indian Ocean. Yes, it is a giant eel. A giant, giant eel that messes with people's memories. It oh, Anastasia. God damn it. Anastasia. It's just a different thing. Anastasia. Anastasia is so pretty close. I kind of, I kind of chalked it up to victory in pronunciation. Yeah. yeah. But anyways. This may it's get. Uh-huh. What was that? It is. I believe it is one of the places they get uh, 
that SCP is one of the sources they get the, I forgot what it's called, the stuff they use to wipe people's memories. Gotcha. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and... Come on, Discord. Do this. That way, when the video log plays, you can hear it. Alright. Oh, not video log. Audio log. I don't know why I said video log. Anyways. Time to read the anomaly. 3,000 to 1. First Officer Silas Crow s sighed as she closed the bulkhead door behind her. Sealing the communications room for another day. She sighed again as Tallow handed her a rough approximation of coffee. Still no response to uh, Slipnet? The man asked, nodding, nodding knowingly. Don't you worry, I'm sure someone will pick up soon enough. Silas turned on Tato in a heartbeat, restraining her unrestrained anger flaring in her amber eyes. And how are you so sure? For all we know, we're the last humans on Earth. He put his hands up defensively, trying to leave well enough alone as he turned and exited the alcove, allowing Silas to stew in her rage for a moment. She seated herself next to the blacked-out porthole and stared at the artificial blue light on the opposite side of the cramped hall. She sipped her coffee, frowning at the weak taste and attempted to discern from the various sounds of the submarine. She heard the rush of the ballast flowing from the front of the vessel towards the rear she heard the footsteps of her crewmates as they wandered the common era on the lower deck. She heard the occasional pings of the sonar array, and the fainter pings back as it reflected off the seafloor. However, most among all these things, she heard the dreadful moan of the engine and reactor. Unending in its quest to drag them as far away from where they had started as physically possible. Silas closed her eyes for a moment, trying to remember what the rest, what rest felt like. Instead, she only saw dark brown eyes of the cursed creature that she had seen every day since she boarded this cursed vessel. She shook her head and looked up as someone finally arrived from the break room to relieve her the duty of listening to nothing. Keening. She said, nodding politely as she observed the tight-lipped man who climbed the metal stairs. A few minutes late. Not like you. The man passed without a word, merely a disdainful look, and bolted the door behind him. Silas shrugged it off and stood up. Descending the tight stairs on the lower deck, she spied... Tallow, relaxing, relaxing on his bunk, likely listening to s some inane song on his earphones. She tutted under her breath and continued on to her next duty. Smoke rolled around the broken periscope, coiling, coiling about as it made its way gathered in the recesses of the ceiling. It lingered there, gazing down at the control room and its sole inhabitant. The old man pulled the last of his of the cigarette into his lungs and drowned it in a bucket of sand by his feet. He stared back at the smoke and, and its black serpentine eyes and followed the dusty length of it as it slowly dissipated into the decaying air filters.
Captain John Barrett stood up from his chair with a groan, feeling the same pain in his joints that existed for as long as he would call. He shook his head slowly and carefully. Three hexagonal green pills with the letter W emblazed upon their faces set waiting for him when he opened his eyes, sat upon the control room's primary console as he swallowed the triple dose. The captain observed the electronic map that sat pride of place in the center of that table. They were only just leaving the Bay of Bengal, escaping their certain pursuer under the shadow of Sri Lanka. With any luck, the captain stared back at their path for a little while, hundreds of kilometers snaking toward the Indian Ocean with painful slowness. The captain decided he must be tired and followed the sickly pale green strips of glowing tape away from his chair and towards the rough bunk in the back of the control room. He stared at it for a while, hardly seeing the twisted and stained blanket through the haze of unremembered memories. The captain was interrupted in his mixed thoughts by a knock on the door of his control room. The door remained unbared towards the rear of the ship. After a moment, the specialist Keening entered the room unbidden and examined the sorry state of his superior officer. Captain Barrett, I'm afraid to tell you that D-38120 has been abducted by an unknown entity while procuring fish. D-38620 has returned unharmed. However, our food intake has been halved for the unforeseeable future. The captain took a moment to link the similar numbers to the appropriate people. Michael? Yes, sir. I see. Bring, bring me to young Thomas. I would have words with him. Genuine concern is what greeted Thomas when he returned from his ordeal, and enough to offset the concerning lack of actual coffee in the cup of coffee he held in his shaking hands. The mug held a pitiful amount of liquid. It must have been. Must have had a thicker than normal bottom, probably to keep it stable if the submarine had rocked by something, he thought. The orange in his uniform was fading fast, clearly not intended for prolonged use between washes. But it was still emblazed with the five numbers that should be replacing his name. If not for the kindness of the man next to him, Tallo had brought him a blanket and was in the process of dripping it over him. It didn't do much to stop the chill in his bones, but Thomas appreciated the effort. What he didn't appreciate was the slow and loud approach of Barrett, supposed captain of this vessel. Thomas had not only seen the man a handful of times, but was still enough to leave a frightening impression. He had expected to be called to the bridge and give his report, hopefully after some solid rest, but not for the captain to come down from his post and see him personally. Captain! Greeted Tallow cheerfully. Thomas noted that the young man couldn't decide between a bow or a salute and eventually settled on doing both. I'll get you a drink. No need for that boy. It'll only be a minute. Barrett's booming voice reverberated in the middle inner hall and causing Thomas's drink to ripple cinematically. D-386. Thomas, I'm gonna have to ask you what you saw. If you're able, what happened to Michael? He was grad. We were working in different quadrants at the time. But my light caught on to something big. Gelatinous consistency. A bit fell off, in fact. 
I was able to recover it. Overall, form was long and featureless. I didn't see a head. And when I saw of Michael's tether rope, he was dragged upwards towards the surface. Thomas took a sip of his cooling, not coffee, and took took stock of the reactions around the room. Barrett main, maintained a stoic facade. For the most part, so did Keening, although a hint of disdain slipped through. Concern and sadness was clear to see on Tallow's face, and from what he, he could see of the former First Officer Crow, she was hunched on her bunk and quietly grumbling. I see. Barrett nodded sullenly and stood up from the seat he had taken. Not to his full imposing height, probably because of the low ceiling. Then tonight, we open the last of our drinks and celebrate his life. Kidding took, shook his head and barely masked disgust. You would really throw a celebration for D38120? In these trying times, another man lost to one such as Anastasia is worth mourning. I, I will now, I will now play the video log. Not video log, god damn it, audio log. In three, two, one. Incoming SCP Foundation Network Global Alert. The SCPS Aramita, broadcasting for the SCP Foundation on all frequencies. If anyone is able to receive this signal and is not aware of the situation, the full SCP-001 documentation has been made open access and is being broadcast parallel to this message. Do not go outside day or night without full body coverage. Do not attempt to provide assistance to anyone who has been affected. If you have the means to provide assistance, we are currently positioned off the east coast of Delft Island in the Indian Ocean, requiring medical supplies. This message will now repeat. To the SCPS Aramita, broadcasting for the SCP Foundation on all frequencies. If anyone is able to receive this signal... And that is the end of that story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you pretty much guessed it also being a daybreak tale. Yeah. <laughs> so they thought that the guy died from, you know, uh, SCP-3000, but I'm, I get the feeling it was 001. If we want to be technical, SCP-3000, as far as I know, does not kill people. It lures all the people inside of it where they continue to live in memory list Memory full hell. Yeah. I don't know how to describe it. After all, what would you call it when your old memories are completely wiped out and you're being made into someone else? Alright, see you later, Hatchet. And good luck with, and good luck dealing with this stuff. I know I can be taxing. <laughs> but yes. All right. Yeah. 
Anyways, the next SCP story is actually a story about two SCPs that I found out. SCP-3000 and SCP-3001, which is Red Reality. And the uh, Anas Anna Tashia. I can't I can't I am struggling with the name. I forgot how to say it. But you pronounced it perfectly the one time. I know. Uh. Uh, maybe later. Because I still have a couple tails. Yes. Anyways. I want to go ahead and and start read reading. Some are born to endless night. Twenty ninth May, two thousand eight. I am. I was. I will be. I am here. Okay. Okay, it is, it's becoming quite difficult to dream this. Hang on a moment. Diary. I'll be with you shortly. There we go. My name is... Or my name was, at any rate. Jacob Montauk. I am 14 years old. I was born in the St. Timothy Hospital up in Birmingham. I never liked Birmingham. It's not the shavs or the dirt in the street or the dull gray color of the buildings. It's the way the rain doesn't cool or chill or make you think or make a pleasant smell of dirt. It just seems to accentuate the surroundings, making the gray grayer, makes the people's faces into strange and in inarticulate nothings. Sorry, Auntie. Sorry, Auntie is always saying that I'm over articulate and that my prose is wildly self indulgent. She's right, of course. I am only 14. I should be playing in the sun, not writing this pe purple nonsense. So, four days ago, I fell into a shadow. I didn't mean to, it just sort of happened. I stayed late from school with the animation club, and then I tripped and fallen right where a tree blocked the light. There wasn't anyone around to see me. Everything went weird for a moment, like the very beginning of something happening. When you first start to see someone's expression for a moment, before it's all suddenly cut off, I think it's because they saw me sprawled all over where nobody could see or help. So they took me. I don't know what this place is. It's just darkness and oblivion and absence. It's like dreaming. I am quite afraid. It feels like a dream. Hell. For all I know, it probably is a dream. Although I can't seem to wake up. I have these images, this long stream of dreaming images passing through my face. But even as I'm moving through some dream world or building a wall, I'm still in the dark. I can feel it, or at least I can feel its presence in the back of my mind, in the dark with behind the eyes. I'm scared. I can't wake up. June 9th, 2008. 
Nothing has changed. I was dreaming just now about a corridor, and as I went down it, it wasn't there. Strange thing, I don't know what it means. I keep hearing voices. I think there might be others here. I thought they were just part of the dream at first, but I don't think they're mine at all. It's hard to explain. It's like there are other dreamers, and I can hear their dreams. It's becoming easier to tell. I'm sorry, diary. I shouldn't write more on you. But there's not much to write except the perpetual onslaught of dreams. Well, you're a dream too, I suppose. But you're there to keep me from going mad, not to help me. June 17th, 2008. There are others, I'm sure of this now. They're all around me. I can hear some very clearly. Some keep coming in. Some are quieter. Some are more indistinct. I don't think it's just a distance thing. This place doesn't seem to have things like distance. Some of them just seem more, I don't know, not quite as there as the others. Absent-minded, I suppose. I kept dreaming about that corridor, making it bigger. Looks more like a hotel now. June 24th, 2008. I can't stop thinking about Auntie. I hope she's not worrying. Actually, I hope that she is worrying. It'd be very, very odd if she isn't worrying. Quite apart from being out of character, it means she didn't care. I wouldn't like that. I don't think she would either. There are others here. They have their own dreams, which sometimes keep crossing over with mine, and they steal them. Someone stole my corridor dream. The images were just ripped and crossed over and twisted, and eventually left me. I could, I could hear, see something. I could hear, see something them elsewhere, in someone else's head. But they weren't mine anymore. I dreamt something else instead. A factory that kept repeating. It must be weird back there. Either I'm gone or I'm in a coma. Or something like that. They'll be shedding tears. They'll be talking about how tragic it all is. Maybe making frantic appeals on the TV. I hope it gets somewhere. I hope someone knows what this place is. I think if I just reach out, I shall report back, diary. July 19th, 2008. I forgot about you, diary. Sorry, it's been a hectic month. So it turns out that there are a lot of other people here. I just didn't know how to talk to them. Rose says that it's that way with a lot of new people. That's why they, they stole my dream. Trying to get me to talk, make themselves known. I fan was very apologetic about that. There are a lot of children's here. Children here. All disappeared. They all tripped or went down the wrong alleyway. Or somehow ended up in a shadow without anybody watching. Then they found themselves here. Dreaming away. Same darkness. Same images in their head. Same aimless movement in the void. Apparently everyone is normal at first. Thinking properly. Then slowly they start to be less. Like they're fading. Their dreams start fading. Their minds start unraveling. Eventually, they're little more than a bundle of memories. It can take years. It can take decades. It can take centuries. But eventually, they're all gone. Faded away into the dark. 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 Sometimes these memories and personalities get picked up by others like Rose or Ifen. 
Sometimes it messes your head up, making you forget who you are. In a way, as Rose said, it's like you're not one person, you're many. There's something that bothers me about all of this, though. Nobody here tries to get out. It's like they were all so busy dreaming that we can't really think about getting out. That just our minds in the dark dreaming. Dreaming for what? Anyway, it's good to be around people again. I've forgotten what it was like. Rose has appeared five years ago, apparently. On there, an apple tree in Texas, she was lying in the breeze, thinking about the vastness of the world, feeling the wind between her fingers. Her parents were down the hill. She... No, wait, it wasn't five years. It was fifty. I wasn't talking to her at all. Was I? December 24th, 2008. So here we are, months later. Those of us who are alive celebrate Christmas, dreamt of festive nightmares, and swap them with each other. Ifan joined in too, despite not being her creed. Nick created this wonderful Christmas tree, which we all passed through our minds and gasped at. It was gold, silver, wonderful. Some of those who were Brain seemed to momentarily bounce back to have more of a mind again. It was nice. I used some of Rose's memories of her hometown to make a nice little vision for us all of a town we had Christmas all year. They'd decorate their homes and tanks and talk about the Christmas spirit. It was nice, nicer than some of the dreams I had recently. For a moment, even in the dark, it felt like family. It felt like home, like I was really holding my spoon. And it wasn't just a twisted candle in the dark. But then again, it was the dark for but the lighting of candles. 29th, uh, March 29th, 2009. You are, you were, you will be. There's a girl here who binds us all together. She's called Golia. And she's one of the oldest ones here. She was the same age as me when, when she was taken. It's said that we're stuck down here. In perpetual childhood. Or perpetual adolescence. Dreaming of a power. We can't think about or know what about. Golia was pretty, but that doesn't really matter anymore. All I can see is her mind, her sparkling mind. It was a kind of vaguely fluorescent glow. I'm not sure how to describe it, like a constant spark of an idea. She had lots of ideas. It was her who first worked out how we could communicate with each other. How we could send and steal dreams from one another. I like her. I like her a lot. I don't want to be writing all this down. Actually, not writing it down. And dreaming it down. But still, yeah, go away. Octo October 26, 2009. Goya and I kept talking. She and I, Fan and Nick and Abbas and I all have a little conjure together, but Gulia, Gulia has a bigger responsibility. She keeps everyone sane. There are hundreds, thousands of minds that eventually make their way here. It's hard to talk about distancing, about distance here. As I said earlier, it kind of exists, but not really. It's like a feeling more than a physical space. Like everything here, I suppose. Anyway, I'm being what Auntie calls tiresomely pretentious again. Goya is the mother to thousands. She teaches them how to dream. Tries to keep them together. Takes their memories when 
they can't hold themselves together anymore. She encourages their dreams, makes them bigger and bolder. The other day, there was a frame boy dreaming of, of a set of gears, and he didn't know what to do with them. She took them and made them a grand machine, with workings impossible and greater than anything he could have ever done. He was so happy, his fraying seemed to stop or even reverse for a moment. That was nice. I think Gulia likes me. My dreams aren't the brightest after all, despite what Nick insists. They're so much cleverer. Wait, one too many ERs in there. June 19th, 2010. I don't really need this diary anymore. The conversation of the thousands of us stuck down here is usually enough. As is Gulia keeps me sane. The only thing is I have swerved a memory in a dream today. It was from someone barely alive in the first place. Someone not yet born. They've been cut out, you see. When their last heartbeat, they were stolen. They're dreaming, dreaming, dreaming of the cold and the rage they felt in the instant they've been living through here for a few weeks, batting to and fro, picking up scattered images and memories of the faded. There wasn't much of them left, really, and they had pretty much all unraveled. I picked up the dream, tidied it a bit, and let it fly. It was a strange one, and amalgam amalg amalg of many minds, but the end was understandable. There was this song, this line that was stuck in my head, it kept playing back. There was an abortion under the floorboards, and another in the sink. April 17th, 2012. I hear from the newcomer, newcomers that things were changing up there. Politics, society, technology, it's all moving on. Maybe I wouldn't recognize it. Even if I could perceive it, my fan is beginning to fade. It's sad. I wish there was something I could do. Sometimes can keep people afloat for a while, but sooner or later, the dark claims them all. It's a shame. I fan is, a, is my friend. Gulia is doing what she can for her, but Gulia is beginning to fray herself. I think she's been here for so long. It's a wonder she's not gone already. I don't know what to do. I love them all, but I don't want them to fall to the dark. We have a theory about what it does now, you see. There was a boy, a young fisherman, son named Benoy. He fell into the sea and saw an eel, he, and he saw a darkness behind his eyes. He saw it lunging, but it, in its shadow, before it could bite, he woke up here. Gulia said she knew about the eel. It's an old legend around here, an old dream. One that had been circling the dark since time immemorial. If the eel's in the world, then that means that a dream of it has leaked out. Maybe a lot of the dreams have leaked out. Maybe that Christmas town I dreamt up really existed, or that hotel corridor. Maybe Goya's machine, too. We think that's what the dark is. It's like a radio tower or transmitter for dreams. The dreams are made real. It's what the dark does. But we still don't know what it is or why. June 26, 2012. I never knew back on Earth the joy of swimming in another's mind. Golia and I come perilously close to being one and not two. On occasion, is this love? I think this is love. She sees me more clearly than anyone else, or so she claims. At times, she swears she can see me, 
see properly a physical version of me hovering above her. She says it's nice. Not sure if I believe her though. Still, there are some things that I can't really talk about, like I offend. This a century of her had come unraveled, so I took what was left of her memories. She was my friend, and she had a hard life. Gray communist corridors, a nursery of abandoned children. There were some old dreams there, too, of a man who lived for centuries to protect his little village. China sounds interesting. I wish I, I'd been there when I was alive. So many worlds crawling on the spinning sphere. There was another dream, a painting that depicted the wars of the world. Or part of the world. I wonder how I fun had dreamt that one up. Strange girl. November 29th, 2012. Kolya was born on the ocean step in the 16th century. She grew up riding, shooting, throwing herself through the air with hooves beneath it. And the eternal heaven above. She played in open fields and danced beneath the sky. She moved like a wild thing in the wild world. Then one day she fell down, and in an instant, when nobody was looking, she was stolen away. She came to a place of darkness when her life had barely begun, a place of dreams, a place where humans were not made of flesh and blood but of wood and wire and wax. Little constructs unraveling like wool. She was scared, but she was very brave. Little Golia worked out a little way mm -hmm. to talk. She realized how the dreams could be used. She worked out how to send thoughts to transmit emotion or articulate words. She bound all the minds And her little part of the of the dark to her, like a mother. She was like a mother to so many, keeping the frame whole, making their minds last as long as possible. And she survived, and nobody knew why. But I knew. I was only 14 when I was taken. All those years ago, my mind has grown up. Down here in my emotions with them. I fell in love with Golia. And she with me. And I saw the dark twisting. And the mental happiness of her heart. Her oh so human heart. She was. Uh, buoyed by the love. That, that she was given. The bounds she forged. The memories she collected. She remained herself. Because she lent into being with others and many others. Little Goya of the Kazakh Owls was so far from home, so removed from time. She lived far longer than she was meant to. She was quick and bright. I know why she died. It was because that whole time, despite all the memories she had maintained and all the brightness she had at attained, she was still herself. She couldn't change. She wasn't in a state of flux. Gulia was an I. She had a notion of the self which held her together, but slowly died in the blackness of the night. Today I dreamt of a man who could never die, but poisoned all around him. I am in the I am in mourning. I wear this black around me like a funeral suit. And yet, in the midst of the dark, an idea occurs, monstrous one. And one that, if it works, could avenge my lost love's death. January 1st, 2013. So, I propose the following idea to the others. 
We are fairly sure that the things we dreamt are made real. We can control what we dream. We all enter the world in a state of collapse and flux and dine perpetually until we, we finally unravel and become more than a ball of stray thoughts. We cannot survive alone. The more we interact and mend with the others around here, the longer we last. But we can't last forever as long as we hold onto a state of being. A state of knowing that we're a self, otherwise we fray into tiny strands, picked up as a stray thoughts by the others still left alive. So I came up with an idea. The only way we can survive is to become one. We must all sacrifice our individual natures and merge. One being, one child of many, a mind of madness strung together by nerve and wire because we're stronger together. Some ejected, some said that this happens anyway, and we slowly fade. We are all lost. We are all sprung apart, scattered among the new children who are, who are scattered in their turn. Why hasten the process? Why not cling on as long as possible? Because I said, if we are strong enough, focused enough, hive-minded enough, then we could dream ourselves. We could ne never have left our families. We could never return, uh, we could return to the lives that were stolen. To the childhood swept away, we could feel the wind on our skin again. That convinced them. We may have a little pleasures down here. But when you're never sure where you begin and darkness ends, when things like morning and afternoon and night are frail and arbitrary anchors we have invented, when our mothers are far away in an unknown place in time, when you live like that, you can't help but want to get out. February 8th, 2013. They are, they were, they will be. We were born in England, Iran, America. We were raised in Texas, Beijing, and in Midwest. The final s steps. We are Jacob, Apis, Nick, Iphan, Rose, and Golia. We are, we, we were, we will be. We see many things. No, I do. No, we all do. We see the others, their dreams, their fears, they are them. They are us. We are many, and we act as many. We see dark, we see light, we create strange images of a deal with a devil and a frozen land, of a faceless market stretching into endless night, of another dying in an, another dark, of elephants weeping for their lonely mother, it aches, our substance ache, aches, or what is left of it. It seizes with the pain of many. All we want to do is curl up and be alone, and we can, never can. May we wake up from this infernal prison. March 19th, 2045. Diary. We know of this diary. It was a product of the mind of the one of the founding members, Jacob Montauk. This element still exists with us. We decided to use it to siphon off the thoughts of that hive. We are all voluntary members of a large collective organist, organ monkey grinder of some sort. It's getting harder to be ourselves. To be one, we have absorbed a large chunk of the total number of the missing now. There are still many hundreds of thousands to go, but we're getting there. It's getting harder to met, to think, to attach a meaning to words. We were for the time being, but soon we may not be, or rather, we will be, but we can, but, but can we attach 
a meaning to what to that when there's nothing outside of it. If we are in a universe, if we are to, we are to the the vo the blah the oblivion then is there an oblivion at all? Do we only exist when defined against the other? Nothing is definite. For our dreams are unseen now and full of monstrous and forgotten thoughts. We have to ruminate on this further, further, further into the void. March 19th, 3,994 We are, we were, we will be. The Christian weight of all that ever was as the last child becomes part of the one. Let me tell you, no, let me, let one part of me tell you another part of, of me a story. There are new parts added all the time. We work like clockwork, an engine in the dark. I dreamt today of a man imprisoned. He betrayed his foe as he stood suspended over the top of an idea blasted into space forever. A war of ideas that went around and around forever. I dreamt of a of a of a crown in red, of a fire in gold, in gold, of seven brides for an emperor. Imprisoned, he will be here. He will be free, but he'll die like all the rest, screaming in his own pointlessness. This facade of, of his fiction scattered and to the winds. All right, uh, I dreamt today of a vagabond, writer, artist. I dreamt he lived, breathed free, learned what life was, and that his thoughts echoed a thousand, thousand, thousand miles hence. I dream today of an ancient tradition, of the little communities and frozen pleasures, of the common folk skating on ice forever, pirouetting and twisting in one of in many times and places. I dream today of a cemetery that did not belong, ghost of a future war that snarled and scraped and scraped against the children of humanity and the children of the machine. Auntie was right about Jacob being irrationally pretentious. It could have been described so much better than that. One year after the death of reason, the winds could whistle over the rider the waters, the hills, the oceans. It would fly free, kicking up sp sprat and dust foam over sand. The beaches under the midnight sun were ever-changing, ever-present, where vagabonds and lovers would sink, or would sit and think and kiss. Hops grew in, waiting for fields beyond the moors. Little clay huts scattered around the entrance to the walls. Little gray s skies kissing little gray clouds. The rain wetting the cross and soaking the waters. Walkers. Not waters. Running through some wilderness of woodland and overcast weather. Marble columns in front of the libraries. The smell of paper and books, musty and welcoming. The lights of, the, of a train as it plunged through the tunnel. Shh. Shaking all inside as they hugged up against the cold. The sight of an ancient bazaar. There isn't a world anymore. There's just dark. It won. It took our dreams and it won. We are all that's left of what was a memory engorged upon itself. The last scraps took themselves from time. We are the dark, and we are suspended here. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And all goes into the dark. Sunday, 
some rough beast slouches towards Bethlehem, grinding rebar and freezing concrete. An unknown time in a sky of inky black, Nicholas Nick Halsinger was born in the Midwest. He was born to a loving family. In winters, he would skate on the ponds and laugh with his friends. But he had another habit. On very cold and crisp and clear nights, he would go to the bridge in town and stare over, stare out over the ponds, looking at the stars reflected in the water. Nobody was watching, so they took him. But after that, while he dreamt beneath the world, his family and friends in Paris persisted, and they thought in their minds of, of a hundred thousand different ways he could have been killed. Every fantasy, every twisted paranoid dream and nightmare brought to the fore on the cusp of, of their minds, dreaming of the ways he could have been taken. But they were all aspects of the of a greater whole. They weren't separate scenarios at all. They were darkness. But they were all aspects of a greater whole. They weren't separate scenarios at all. Oh, I read that. My bad. One more strand for every child taken. An endless circle. The dark exists because it has to exist. In the minds of every frightened and demented parent scared for their child's life, they already know what it means to, to their children, because they can see it, they can see the dark. We never stood a chance. The heat death of the universe, 3 p.m. in the afternoon, Eastern Standard Time. Where am I? I float lost in time. I awake with all these voices in my head. Am I plural, or are we singular? I don't know anymore. It's all dying, matter itself. The rocks crumble into dust. The dust crumbles into atoms. The atoms crumble into waves of energy. Concepts roll in on themselves. Even the dark is dying. Its purpose done, its crimes committed. A greater void awaits beyond it. It's coming now, slowly, achingly, that oblivion that ends me, us. The dark was just a memory of humans. A feeling, a fear that bound. But what awaits is more. What awaits is not a thing. with a capital letter and an ominous feeling. We often fail to understand what it is to be blind. I know for I have dreamt for a thousand years to be blind. Blind to so many things, people think that being blind is like having your eyes shut. But it's not. When your eyes are closed, they can still, still see blackness, the fires in your retina. The colors of your brain. To be blind is not to see that. To be blind is not to see nothing. But to be incapable of seeing. A void in your he head where your eyes should be. To die is not to sleep. To die is not to dream. To die is not even to find oneself in an undiscovered country. To die is nothing. To die is never have been. Because all that war... Is erased. Uh oh, because all that was is erased. There's just an end, an oblivion. I was once so scared of the dark that took me, but it doesn't matter now. The dark is a thing like all other things, and it will die too. Soon there will be nothing but absence. I can't remember who I am. Let me do something, give something back. Let me give her back, let her live, or a memory of her. A shade, a vision of furs and skins. Riding on horseback with the wind within her, 
within her air. Last syllable of recorded time. This is how the world ends. This is how the world ends. This is how the world ends. Not with a bang, but a whimper. It's coming now. The moment moments are shrinking. The area contracting. The dark is fraying and ripping. I shall be brief, diary, my constant companion within infinity. I am Jacob Montauk. I did not mer merge with the others at all. I absorbed them. I ate them. I did not realize it until just now. At the end, I murdered them all to keep me alive. I failed all the memories, minds, and souls. I, I took into me. Made me unable to think or to remember. This is all dust now. All is calamity. I should have dreamed us back centuries ago. Millennia. Eons. But I couldn't think. And there, then there was the dark. There was nothing to be dreamed about. Back into. Just an end. How could I let them go back to their lives? Their realities? When all will be dark. England. I shall dream of England. I shall dream of her fields. White of sun and winter. Flush with dew in spring. Oh, wait. Uh, light snow in winter. Fresh and dew in spring. I shall dream of her hills. Her, of her hedge groves and bushes. Her rose gardens. Her marble columns and concrete abhorrences. I shall dream of England so that she lives. Some small twisted shadow of her. Some dying breath of my home. I can do something for, for the others, though. Maybe I can take dreams some something back. Show them history. Show them all that will be. Show them how to fix things. Someone, whoever is out there, whoever understands what, is, what it is to die in the dark. So others can live in the light. It's coming now. It'll be over soon. And then I won't be able to be alive anymore. I won't have to be stolen child dreaming for millennia about half remembered reality that will waste to nothingness anyways. Dark, dark, dark. They will, they will, they all go into the dark. And that's it. That was dark. Well, I mean, you're dealing with red reality. What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> that's fair. But that means, like, in one universe, red reality created SCP-3000. Yep. In one reality. <laughs> nice. Anyways, I'll be right back. I gotta take Busta out, as well as Gooch. Alright. I'll be back.
I am back. Welcome back. And what's that? Alright, the good news is there'll be someone coming Friday to test to see if if they can uh adapt a uh, gooch. Oh, very nice. Yeah. All doggos deserve a nice home. Yeah. Let's let's start trying to get into the root beer. <laughs> and sometimes a doggo with a nice home snaps. Yeah. And now bust the in a puppy or tearing up my bed. Of course. Oh. <laughs> Anyways. Everyone ready to hear the next story about SCP-009, a.k.a. Red Ice? Alright. Three, two, one. My lonely child, I see you standing there. You brace your arm against a tree as snow piles upon your shoulders. You can't be older than twenty, clad in an orange jumpsuit and a dark gray raincoat. Your tiny body shivers as you trudge through the snow. After five steps or so, your foot gets caught on something and you fall to the ground. The impact leaves you with a deep cut on your leg, but your face betrays nothing, not even a single twinge of pain. Each droplet of blood hits the ground and twists my hits the ground, twists my insides a little. You get up and wipe away the dirt and ice that clings to your raincoat, as you didn't even think about it. The wind tussles your brown head of hair as you look around. Fog flood through the, sh the forest and waving your arms does little to clear it. You peer further into the low hanging clouds. Are you looking for me? I fiddle with the question in my mind as you slowly turn and begin walking away. I follow at the distance so that I may see your form while you remain unaware of mine. Ice leeches on my back, sucking out blood through my skin and turning red as a result. I can handle it, even as my hands pulse with pain from hoisting my body above the twigs and leaves, which would betray my presence. I continue, the sight of your face is enough to drive me through the suffocating cold. The face which I helped to grow and mold and, and give to the world. The face of my child. But now you flee, fearing that your life is only minutes away from ending. Where is this monster that chases you? I haven't seen one yet. I stay low to the ground, carefully avoiding your gaze. As you stumble your way up a small hill. You pull yourself over a fallen log using bright pink hands, uttering an obscenity. A shudder shaking off the thick layer of snow that accumulated on my red skin. You don't seem to notice. I crawl around to the side of the hill through a thick grouping of trees which bricks off tiny bits of my skin. As I slide past their bark, I bite my tongue, pulling myself over the top. Before me is a large outcrop of silver rock, which folds inwards, forming half of a metallic-colored hemisphere. You're huddled inside, shivering in the dark. I cling to the side and shut my eyes, letting a barrage of frozen raindrops and pebbles strike my body. 
I withstand the pain for your safety, child. My breaths are short and labored as not to disturb you. I force my heart to pump more blood through my body so that I can give off more heat to warm your cold body. When I hear the rapid staccato thuds of tears striking stone, I peer in through the cracks and watch you bury your face into your hands. Each tear sinks into my heart like a knife. Why are you sad? What frightens you? I search my surroundings, my face growing pale, seeking at that which terrifies you. The sky is empty. The fields are clear. The silence is only offset by the sound of your croaking voice. My search grows more frantic. I raise myself higher and higher as clouds of snow cover my face and chest in white desperate to catch the slightest twitch of movement. Figments of my imagination manifest themselves into the reality around me. The leaves grow bug-like legs and skitter around. The logs open to reveal maws of full of jagged teeth. The trees hide bloodshot eyes. I try to snap, slap my mind out of its illusion. It feels like I'm punching a concrete wall with my bare fists. There is nobody for kilometers that can harm you. I repeat that sentence in my mind over and over again. There are no monsters here. And if there's a beast which has avoided my gaze until this point, I am here to serve as your manic protector, ready to tear it to pieces. You cry louder like a dying sheep surrounded by wolves. I lower myself back down to the cracks as I... As a bitter realization seeps up into my mind. Is it me? Am I the reason you stand terrified in the cold? My grip tightens on a wall. And my teeth sink further into my flesh. To stop myself from weeping. Millions of thoughts float around in my brain. Telling me to speak or whisper. Or fucking scream at you. But I don't. I'll let my voice die for now. The infinitely tall tower of emotion my mind that teeters on the edge of collapse settles. And I let my anger leak into the wind as you talk to yourself. God, kill me. Please fucking end me. You can see me here and now. Take my life. I'll be fine if I go to hell. Just bring me anywhere else but here. God damn it, please, God. Please hear me for once in your stupid fucking life. You say into your into your hands. I scream. The pain and anger and frustration shoots out of me like spikes towards you, overflowing my focal cords. Rocks turn into dust in my hands as I decimate your fortress. You pray for death. You would rather die out here alone in a cold than take one look at me. And that's just what you'll get. I crawl over the remains as you bolt away. You trip and tumble down the other side of the hill that looks overlooks a circular field where the snow is light enough to where you run comfortably. Your raincoat flies from your arms as you fall to your almost certain death. Red tears fall from my eyes, partially blinding me as I advance. I know I kept saying that my love for you is greater than any pain you can inf inflict upon me. That wasn't meant to be taken as a challenge. This test of yours only feel fuels the stupid, deranged side of me that wants to do something I know I'll regret later. Yell these words to you but my throat closes with emotion, only letting incoherent shrieks and howls through. Falling to the bottom of the hill, you crack your head open against a hard patch of ice, spraying blood out onto the snow. You cover your wound and continue running, screaming for help. You want help? 
You would have died already if it weren't for me, you ungrateful bitch. I roar for the un umpteenth time. Blood begins to shoot out from my throat before rearing back and diving into the earth. The dirt splits like water and I dig through the hard earth, which cracks my fingernails. The sound of your footsteps guides me. My anger and frustration motivate my arms to dig faster. My back protrudes out of the earth as I swim towards you. My exposed skin bristles at the sudden influx of cold, like someone took a freezing rod to it, thawed it, and then refroze it again all in a few moments. You ask again for somebody to save you or kill me. The now blood-red ice that clings to my skin dislodges, forming two long trails on either side of me as I surge towards you. I dig faster and faster, barreling past you on your left. Your legs hit the ground faster, desperately trying to get ahead of me. I suddenly veer right, blocking off your path with a mountain of ice. I circle around to the hole that marks where I dug into the ground initially, forming a massive ring around you. There's nowhere else to go but back to me. I emerge from the ground and see you scanning the wall for any possible paths through. There are none. You drop to your hands and knees for a better look, careful not to, to touch the ice. I walk towards you. My steps slow and deliberate. You wanted a monster? Oh, I'll show you a monster. My body reveals itself to you. My arms, the dozens and dozens of limbs which tightly hung, my serpent-like frame unfurl to carry me to you. Hundreds of hands create claw marks in the ice. As I am pushed up towards the sky, I am above you now. My arms acting as the fleshy bars of your prison cell. Spots dot my underbelly, leading your vision towards my head. A large mass of pink flesh which extends out of my mouth like a tongue. Slowly strips of flesh detach themselves from me with a large suction sound. There are eyes, many, many eyes. Surrounded by puffy mounds of skin and bones that are attached to my skin with long red tendrils. My division splits into twelve different spots as the tendrils encircle you. You weep louder. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you not like your wish? I'm giving you exactly what you asked for. Yet you blame me when you realize that you can't handle it. I extend two sets of hands out to you. You scream in protest. A grin composed of misguided fury and death grows on my face. You look down at the ice for a while in deep thought. Take one, one last look at my body. Extend your hand out and try to slam it down on, onto a, an icicle. The last of your rebellion ends as the rest of them did. My arms are too fast. I catch you in my grasp. Your whines and sniveling grunts excite me, but I don't know why. I'm scared. You pound on my fist, screaming that I'm a monster, that you are not my child, that you would be better off if you, you had snapped your neck on the hill. I hold you to my chest, ignoring your comments. I will not cry, not in front of you. I will withstand your attacks. I will still love you. Somebody, please help me. Please, God, don't let this thing hurt me. Someone just fucking kill it. You say. And I still love you. Fuck you. Get your hands off me, you. You, s you say. And I still love you. Uh, what are you waiting for? You fucking... You fucking kill me. That's what you wanted to do. How long have you been waiting? Just watch me from the shadows. You sick fucking coward. You say, and I still, wait, I, I can't, and I, and, 
and then there's nothing left of you to love. You are all, all you are is a lifeless piece of meat and bones in my hands. I crush you in my palm, pushing your face and arms and legs into a pulpy mess of red. That is your, that is your skeleton. There are no death throes. I rear back and scream into the sky. My child has died, and I am the murderer. Please kill me, whoever is out there. Slay the beast, the monster that felt nothing when I took the life of their own child. Please, anyone. My grief is only interrupted by a small, hard object which moves through my throat. I cough violently as pain shoots through my body. Instantly, I know what the object is. My vision shakes and my consciousness wavers. I lay on the ice next to your broken figure. The color fades from my body as I slowly regurgitate the object into my maw. One by one, my eyes lose strength and fall to the ground. I pull you closer to me, carefully extending my heart out with my teeth. I consume your body, which mixes with my heart and turns into a frozen sculpture of flesh. Long strings of mascara conculate and spool into my stomach as I feel my life returning to me. You feel so warm, so happy. I weep, but I am not sure whether it's due to sadness or joy. I look at the empty sky and icy forest. Everything has an aura of loneliness about it. I suppose if someone was looking upon me now, they would think the exact same thing. Well, I'll let them think that the thought. None of them can hurt me. I only feel through my child, and my child only feels through me. I slither back across the field, beginning a long and rough journey home. And that is it of that story. That exists. <laughs> you weren't expecting that with red ice? I don't think so, but I don't know why. <laughs> it's a very cracked out SAT, but there's so many stories on it. I shouldn't actually be surprised. Though it does sound like the dipshit they were following had a chance to live and threw it away. Yeah. Uh, just give me a moment. Just, just trying to figure something in a moment.
Hmm. Where is it? Are you having trouble finding it? Uh, yeah, I'm having trouble finding the anomaly connected to the next SCP. Ah! It was the back door, right? Finally found out. The next SCP uh, this, that's connected apparently uh, is 076. Hmm. I thought it was something else. But I guess not. I think. Because... What it says is on the, on the series hub what it's connected to. So as far as I'm aware, I think that is what it is. You mean the SCP you just read? No. Oh, the one you're looking for? Yeah. Okay, I was a little confused for a second. Yeah. Alright, anyways. Time to read the next story. <clears throat> this is not me talking. They watched as they got closer and tore themselves asunder and everything in between. It was a thing that was not there. It did not exist, at least not on the level of narrative. It had no part to play in any of their stories, nor would it ever. Their trauma did not concern it, but their failures did not harm it. Their triumphs meant nothing to it. This left it in a rather unique position. It could watch. Such fascinating creatures, it did not recall exactly when it started observing them. It supposed that this is when it came to being in the first place. It did not know, know that its first memory of them was a boardroom, such an electric bunch of personalities. Color-coded outfit on one, a ridiculous hat on another, shadows surrounding a third. From the first, it seemed very odd to it that this bunch should be the bul bulwark of humanity. Though it was not human, indeed, if it wasn't anything, so it was assured. It couldn't help but think that the three, that the thirteen figures inhabiting its preferable birth chamber shared very little with their so-called wards. So this one, it thought, number 10, it believed, sitting quietly, only raising her voice once when a vote was called. Observer watched her and saw a thousand timelines spooled beneath her like earthworms beneath the thin crust of the soil. When did she have in common with an average person. It looked at her eyes, ancient with knowledge. Numerous non-existing worlds, and saw very little that was human in them. Not anymore. 
It looked further to number four. If ten had the weight of years behind her, four had space. Observer could see distances spreading behind them, unwinding endlessly. This was a man who could walk anywhere it could tell, though the man himself didn't seem to realize it. There was something arrogant in his posture, in the way he seemed to throw his weight to fill every available space. When decisions mean nothing to a person, Observer reflected, when one was always free to go where one willed, it was only natural that a certain sense of superiority would develop. Then there was thirteen. Observer enjoyed this one most of all, or perhaps it was a grim fascination. It did not wonder why one meant only to watch should feel as it did. It needed a name. Even those who do not exist needed a way to refer to themselves, so it, it was assured Observer would do. Some time later, Observer watched the multi-version man pour himself a cup of weak coffee. He had first considered the inhabitants of its birthing chamber strange. It was only because Observer was not yet exposed to creatures of the man's ilk. As the man sniffed and frowned at the contents of his styrofoam cup, His face shifted and twirled before Observer's keen gaze. The man's ordinary middle-aged features grew sharp and pointed, and his tired frown twisted into an unnatural toothy grin. His white lab coat was now a long coat, and his formerly bare hand now bore a strange wide-brimmed hat. Observer seemed to be the only one to notice this, as none of the cafeterias other inhabitants made any sort of note of the man's sudden change. A moment passed, and a grey man's hand head was now that of a grey owl, wide-eyed and bemused. Starts with a C and ends with an F. I always start with a C and end with an F. Smashes heads with a C and charm with an F. Science with a C and death with an F. Internal monologue, peculiar. Observer watched all this with muted interest, as it seemed to always do. It had watched a man undergo this sort of transformation many times before. The man was not only one of his type. Observer has watched the multiversion wander around the various sites it chose to watch twisting and shifting between different forms, without them or anyone else but Observer noticing. It seemed odd to Observer that creatures so strange could pass off as human, not only to others, but even to themselves. To it, they seemed anything but. Everyone knows I'm C and, and an F. All I am is C and an F. If I am not a C and I am not an F, then I am not a C and I am not an F. Their names, they all seemed to, so fascinated with their names. Almost like they were truly not their own. Dance in the rain with a C and an F. Eat the whole sky with a C and an F. All I do for the C and the F. Fuck all the world for the C and the F. Oh dear, here it went again. Not showing any outward agitation. The owl-headed multi-version finished his coffee and turned towards the pastry cabinet as the alarm went off. In the distance came the sounds of gunfire, as well as what sounded like a roar. The multiversion, now back to his tired middle-aged persona, did not seem alarmed by any of this. Instead, he simply sighed and grabbed an errant blueberry muffin and began wa walking towards the source of the noise, chewing absent-mindedly. Ah, time to go to work for the C and the F. Entertainment in the name of the... <clears throat> there was a sudden spring to the man's steps. Observer was not surprised. Most of the creatures appeared to lack any real sense of self-preservation. This was... Observer supposed because they had no true notion of self-interest. 
their will belonged to those who imbued them with their names. And those hidden masters cared only for whatever entertainment and glory their namesakes could accomplish in their name. Slaves in all but name. Reality could be so very droll. Observer thought, never stopping to consider its sudden change of attitude. It was not yet time. C and the F. Blood for the C. A small type version man vanished behind the corner. Observer was torn between pity and contempt for the creatures. They were puppets. It was true, and that alone was no reason to hate them. But Observer has seen all too often. What happens to those who happen to get entangled with them in their strings? Their other selves clouded reality around them like a, a miasma. And sickly light of their masters will tore at it. A diseased claw about the face of narrative. Enjoy for the F. Observer listened as screams joined gunfire and roars and shook its non existent head. What hope could humanity have with such an affection in its midst? Observer did not know. It only knew that it was glad. It was not the same. That is the name. That is the name. Add two more letters, and that is the name. Poor wretched things. Observer was free to think its own thoughts. The irony of it of this statement was lost on it. Observer sat on the young woman's shoulder, looking as she did at the enormous scarred man. He was busy removing bits of shrapnel from one grotesquely muscled shoulder with one hand while chewing what happened happened to what appeared to be a whole cow's head he was holding in the other. Observer turned his gaze to the woman and could not quite read the expression on her face. Hatred was there, clear as day, but it seemed to Observer that there was something false about it. The one was not a multiverse versioned in what it considered the classical definition of the term, but, but she shared some of the characteristics regardless. There was something poorly defined about her, as if she existed in many worlds at the same time, and yet not really in any of them. You enjoying that? Mmm. Good meat. Crunchy. Where's your sword? Mmm. Stuck in something. Observer had been watching a woman for a considerable amount of time now, and little about her truly made sense to it, much like those in its birthing chamber. The woman had odd powers, and much like them, she failed to realize how her possession of them distanced her from being truly human. Unlike them, however, this lack of perception did not seem to be internal, as if she forced into being as she was by someone else. Perhaps this was so, observer pitied her. The poor thing didn't even know what she was, not like it knew. Yes. Observer understood her so perfectly. Mind if I take some pictures then? Might need them for later. Mm. Yeah, thought as much. Mm. This again, Observer thought, as it made itself more comfortable on a woman's shoulder. It had heard it so many times before. Observer did not pause to consider that it was now sitting on her shoulder. Something... It would never have done earlier in its poorly defined lifetime. Sitting and thinking and pitying were those for, were for those who existed, and Observer did not, truly did not, honest. The woman turned her gaze away from the scarred man and rummaged a small pack she held at her shoulder, taking out a small camera. The scarred man turned to the woman for a moment, 
muttered something in a deep guttural voice and returned his attention to a still bleeding meal. Observer watched as the comment momentarily filled the woman's mind, then passed over it, leaving nothing behind. She glanced at the man again, shrugged, and then returned to taking pictures. Ah, this was the heart of the observer's trouble at understanding both the young woman and the scarred man. Obviously, there was a history between them, a troubled past filled with hurt and failure, but neither of them nor anyone else involved with them seemed to fully realize this. Oh, people acted as if they were aware of it, often mentioning it and pretending who base their decisions on it, but in truth, it was weightless as a leaf in a drunkard's, drunkard's dream. I was here enjoyed hit this metaphor. It thought it was clever. Right, I'm done here. You ready to head off, big guy? Hmm. I see another cow over there. God damn it, eh? Observer flew off. Words, empty words repeated. Ad nausea. Clichéd interactions and predictable outcomes. It was as if someone was not even trying very hard. Those two will never change as long as they continued to be used as they were. Their world will always be the same. It was almost enough to drive Observer to despair. Or drive someone, at least. Observer was now high above, watching the blue orb beneath spin lazily as it drifted like an elderly whale in the black depths of space. All, all of those it watched before it could not be seen from here. Observer found some comfort in that. From here, the world seemed almost free. Each spin, each spin would bring about something new to it. Some new event or place or person. Who could, could change everything about it. It was a flimsy illusion. Knowing that what Observer knew. But one it re relished regardless. Observer's time amid and people of this world changed it. And it now realized. It had grown to care about it. Though it still did not truly exist. It was now embroiled in the world's drama was in some way a part of his grand narrative. Though the world will not change, though its various inhabitants will do everything in their powers not to let it change. Observer knew it would keep watching. Perhaps one day, the invisible masters of this world, its grand narrative will tire. Perhaps one day, the people living in it will once more be free to make their own decision. Observer doubted it. it, was as it remembered it knew very little. It could be wrong. Perhaps one day this world will truly be truly born anew. For now, all of this was perpetual stillbirth. Wait. Observer paused at the sudden unbearable drama contained in that last segment. This does not sound like something it would think. It was Observer, wasn't it? A non-existing being, a watcher? Why did it feel so strongly about any of this? Why did it care at all? All that time it realized it was passing judgment on those it saw, pitying them for their lack of freedom, hating them for bearing the names of others, ridiculing them for their, their strings. Horror filled the observer as it suddenly understood where all that came from. As it looked about its no longer non-existent form, it saw strings hanging from every limb. Ah, it understood now. Observer has become Avatar, a mouthpiece, like all the rest of them. An ironic demonstration. Avatar understood this fully now, and understood had nothing to say about it either. Had nothing to say about anything. It was not its place. As it opened its new mouth to speak, the only words that came out were mine. 
And that's it. I don't think it was mainly about evil. <laughs> Makes me wonder what this SCP was mainly about. I mean, the, the story about. Huh. First time hearing about something calling an observer. Oh well. Anyways, anyways, we're gonna go on intermission while we wait. We'll be in here while we wait for someone to come back. Mm -hmm. Patrons, I'll be back as well. So I hope you enjoy. Uh, well, my animation scene at least. <laughs>
I am back. I don't think. Um. I don't. I don't know if they'll come back anytime soon. The next story. Is when they broke the unbreakable reptile. <clears throat> we are assigned to SCP 682. They tell you there are three laws of nature you must believe. One, there's no such thing as immortality, everything will die eventually. Be it from murder, accidents, or just old age. Two, everything has a weakness. If everything can die, then everything can be made to die. Anything can be killed. Three, under no circumstances can you believe, even for a second, even subconsciously, that SCP-682 can't be killed. Of course, those apply to more to the researchers trying to terminate SCP-682, but I still believe them wholeheartedly. I wasn't there to try to terminate 682, though. I... I am... was... a psychologist. Sent in by the Foundation to try to study the reptile. And make a psychological profile of it. Essentially, I was trying to understand how the mind of pure destruction and hatred worked. It was part of a new initiative in the Foundation, trying to approve the containment procedures of sentient SCPs through understanding them psychologically. And, and maybe even find a way to make them more complacent and reduce the number of attempted breaches. Everyone said I was mad when I requested SCP-682. Maybe I am. Maybe I wouldn't have been here if I wasn't mad. But, there, but here I was every day for a month. Staring at a giant, murderous, hard-to-destroy reptile and a vat of acid. And I think it was staring back at me. I knew SCP-682 would never cooperate with questioning or knowingly give me any insight into its psyche. So I resolved to sit and watch it until it started talking to me. Every day I sat with a pen and notebook watching the reptile. And when he had nothing better to do, he watched me back. It felt like I was Claire Starling, starring at Hannibal Lecter instead of Hannibal, except Hannibal at least talked. I knew 682 found me and all the other researchers disgusting. I knew I wanted all life on Earth dead. But I wonder if maybe, just maybe, curiosity would get the better of him. We'll never know because one day, the sun decided that it wanted all life on Earth dead too. On that day, I stood in disbelief in a doorway just barely out of, of the reach of the sunlight, staring out into a sun-bleached world. Heat charged the bare earth. Reds and oranges danced and pulsated, where there were once greens and blues. Friends and co-workers were melting, turning the landscape into a nightmare, surreal painting. Yet, all I could stare at was 682. Flesh melted off the reptile's back almost as fast as it could regenerate it. Maybe faster. It smelled like burnt, rotting flesh and hatred, and sounded like tar bubbling and boiling in the dip deepest parts of hell. What terrified me in that moment more than the containment breach, more than the melted people around me, more than the hateful star, was that no matter what ad adaptations it tried, 
the reptile was still melting. And despite myself, everything I'd held in faith worked for despite the three natural laws that I'd held higher than any regulation, rule, or religion. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that SCP-682 was dying. After several failed adaptations, 682 resorted to piling an already melted flesh on top of itself, curling up as small as possible in an effort to avoid being exposed to more light. It huddled under more of the mass of wriggling flesh that melted off its back, and even as it seemed the flesh was trying to get away, curled up under an umbrella of its own melted back, shying away from any sunlight that threatened to touch 682. Touch it. 682 almost looked scared. The reptile must have noticed me staring at it because it then did the one thing I wanted to do for weeks. It spoke to me. I don't want your pity, human. It turned to look at me, ignoring the sunlight melting the tip of its snout to do so. Aren't you happy? You finally found a way to kill me. Isn't that what every disgusting human in this wretched place wanted? Not like this. I finally found my voice. All I wanted, all the Foundation ever wanted, was to protect humanity. Killing you at the cost of humanity itself? That's not a victory. That's the worst defeat we, we could have had. Then my anger rose along with my voice. Aren't you happy? Almost every living thing on, on Earth is dying. Isn't that what you wanted? 6A2 may have chuckled. Or maybe it was just the boiling of melted flesh. But even then, but even through all that heat, Neptile's voice still sent a chill up my spine. I know death. I revel in death. I want it. death for every disgusting creature that lives. But this. 6A2 snarled at the flesh hissing like a snake. This is worse than death, worse than life, worse than anything either of us could imagine. Even for something as revolting as you, this is not the punishment I would wish. Is that why you're coming back inside? I don't know. I don't know why I said it, or why I kept... Talking after I saw the anger flare up in Arthel's eyes. You hate all life. Does that include yourself? Do you think this death or not death is a fitting punishment for you? I knew I was signing my own death certificate. 682's hatred eclipsed its survival instinct and it slowly got up and lumbered towards me. Dragging the flesh on its back with it, in hindsight, I should have run. I should have at least closed the door. I still can't figure out why I didn't. The reptile collapsed before it got back inside. Before it could even get close enough to hurt me. More and more of its body melted. And its regeneration tried desperately to keep up. It must, I must have been most saying, or maybe it was just a pea of melting flesh. But I swear I saw a tear fall from 682's eyes. Does it hurt? Was all I could think to say. A stupid question, really, and one I should have never asked. The 682's answer surprised and terrified me. Not the way you think it does. You and your termination attempts have caused me far greater pain. The reptile shifted under the weight of its own melted flesh. Turning to look right, look, turning to look at me right in the eyes, 
Do you want another tidbit for your database, little scientist? I'll give you one. Every one of your attempts to kill me has been excruciatingly painful. But this but that's nothing compared to the pain of regenerating after each one. It seems that part of my curse is to feel twice the pain while healing than what I felt from the injury. My mind raced through every termination attempt on 682, every painful procedure, every excruciating moment, the foundation had put it through. I didn't even know a quarter of them, but I already wanted to hurl. But this is nothing like that. The reptile continued. The melting doesn't hurt at all. Not physically. And regeneration is more, little more than a tingle. No, the only pain I feel is for knowing what I'm coming and what I have to admit to myself. 682 inch closer. I should have left. I should have closed the door. I definitely should have asked any other questions. What are you becoming? I choked out. And what do you have to admit? The reptile dragged itself to within centimeters of the door. I still couldn't look away. I still couldn't believe what I was seeing. I have to admit that you were right. 6A2 snarled. That deep down, there's no living thing I hate more than myself. That every day I wished your next attempt to kill me would succeed. And I could finally pass into internal damnation. That maybe melting into, into an undying pile of flesh is the only punishment I could truly deserve. As for what I'm becoming. It, it said, finally pushing up from its, from its crouch. That should become obvious soon enough. Oh god, how do I even describe the sound it made? It was like a cry of pain and a sigh of relief. A scream of hatred and a spout of pure joy all rolled into one. 682 threw the flesh out of it, shielding it off its back. Stood on its hind, leg hind legs and screamed at the sun. As long as I live, I'll never forget seeing 682 melt and regenerate and melt constantly as the sun beat down on it. The pile of flesh grew bigger and bigger as the reptile shed its melting skins, one after another, each one wriggling and writhing as if it was alive. I think I know what hell looks like. All I could do was stare in horror as SCP-682 threw layer after layer of melted skin off its body. Seen 682 survive tortures and mutilations crafted by the most sadistic minds on Earth, and yet this, this was more horrific than any, than all of them combined. It was like the sun was fighting SCP-682's regeneration to see which was faster, and 682 was helping the sun. Suddenly, I was sitting back, and the door was closed in front of me. The hell are you doing? And MTF shouted at me. There's an XK in progress and 682 broke containment. We have orders to shelter in place. So we can do fuck all about it. And you're just standing there gawking at the doorway. Wow, whatever the hell that. Hey, you okay? When you're assigned to SCP-682. They tell you there's three law of natures you must believe. One. There's no such thing as immortality. Everything will die eventually, be it from murder, accidents, or old, or just old age. Two, everything has a weakness. If everything can die, then everything, then anything can be made to die. Anything can be killed. Three, under no circumstances can you believe, even for a second, 
even subconsciously, that SCP-682 cannot die. On that day, as I stared blankly at the MTF, all I could say was three words. Three words that on any other day would have been cause for a great celebration the Foundation had ever seen. Three words that, on the day of all days, were absolutely terrifying. SCP-682 is dead. Little scientist, are you there? I don't hate you anymore, little scientist. The sun is so beautiful. I want to share it with you. Won't you come out and watch the sun with me? And that is the end of that story. Well, I don't think 682 is fully dead. <laughs> it just turned into a when day breaks instance. Anyways. Yes, we're on to the next story. The little robot that could. SCP-2785 sat in his room. It was a small room, and there was not much to do. But SCP-2785 didn't mind. He knew that if he just sat in, in his room, eventually... He'd be let out again, he'd get to transform again, and he'll get to be with his friends again. Just the thought made him happier than the happiest clam on earth. But something was not right here. Normally, SCP-2785 could hear his friends talking outside. What they talked about, SCP-2785 could only guess. Maybe they were talking about letting... SCP-2785 out. Maybe they were talking about cats and dogs. However, 2785 then hear his friends talking. He heard them screaming instead. SCP-2785 had confusion when it came to screaming. Some of his friends told him that it meant that they were scared. 2785 didn't understand scared. After all, if you were nice enough, why would anyone hurt you? Some of them also told him that it meant that they were having so much fun, they were exhilarated. 2785 also had confusion for that. How could she be having so much fun? You were scared of it. SCP-2785 had heard of roller coasters. Cars attached to trains, tracks, that zip to you around so fast you become exhilarated. Does that mean, mean that his friends built a roller coaster? Mm -hmm. Were they going to show it to him as a surprise? 2785 simply could not wait to get out. However, 2785 did have to wait. So he waited. He waited. And listened to the screaming. SCP-2785 was sitting in his room, imagining what he would do if he got out, when all of a sudden, it became dark. Normally, SCP-2785 would have not been able to see in the dark. He would have been as blind as a schoolgirl who has gone blind. But a few Transformers came back. He had acquired the ability to see in the dark. 
So he saw in the dark, and he saw something strange. There was a door to it in his room, a door that stayed shut no matter what, and today, the door had opened. If, if 2785 could have, he would have passed out from exhilaration. SCB-2785 walked out, and he saw, saw that it was a mess. Tables were flipped over, objects that were formerly resting upon them scattered across the ground. Fluids of almost every type covered the walls and floor. Lights were smashed and doors were detached from their hinges. And paintings had, that had given 2785 curiosity in the past were defaced to the point where they were no longer gave him curiosity. SCP-2785 almost passed out from non-acceleration. And where were all of 2795's friends? Were they on vacation? Sometimes when his friends were gone, his other friends said that they had gone, they had took a vacation. And soon enough, they came back. Maybe all of them had taken a vacation. SCP-2785 got an idea. The place was a mess and all of his friends were on vacation. What if he cleaned up the place and made it spick and span? When his friends came back, they'd be so happy. They'd make the happiest man alive look sad. But first, SCP-2785 had one thing to take care of. After his transformation, during which he had acquired better seeing, eye, better seeing the dark, and better tools for his hand. 2785 decided to listen to the air. He found that inside his room, he couldn't listen to air, even if he wanted to. 2785 began to read, and he saw that saw those that were melting. That was strange. Maybe they're having their transformations too. That would explain why they were on vacation. SB-2785 found a stash of books that looked useful, if only he could read. Of course, SB-2785 could read in his native language, but in English, he only learned a handful of words. He, he was almost as illiterate as somebody who could not read. That just won't do. Wouldn't do. He had to learn a little, maybe a lot. He picked up the first book and got started. SCP-2785 decided to start with the main foyer. He had found a mop and a somewhat clean bucket of water to clean up the goop on the floor. He had found some perfectly good glass panes to replace the broken windows, in addition to grabbing some old furniture from the storage closet. SCP-2785 had read through Carpentry 101 and mostly understood how it worked. As SCP-2785 started mopping, he thought how about what he would do when, when his friends got back. Maybe he would have a party. A party would be nice. SCP-2785 had been allowed to attend only a couple of staff parties. They had good people, good talk, and amazing decoration. His friends would love it if he set up a party all by himself. The thought excited SCP-2785, but he couldn't have a party with goop all over the floor. So he mopped, and mopped, and mopped, and mopped a little more. One of the hallways, a couple hallways over from his old room, had part of a ceiling that had completely caved in. A massive pile of dirt took up the room, with bits of steel, rebar, and stone mixed in. The pile was soaked from broken pipes above it, which had since gone dry. It would take a long time to remove this pile. All SV-2785 had was a shovel and a place to put it. Research Carolyn's dormitory on 5th floor. SV-2785 figured that she wouldn't mind. 2785 shoveled up a small pile and began carrying it. 
After all, he had nothing better to do. SCP-2785 was replacing a light bulb near a second floor window break room when a thought came to him like a bullet out of a gun. Friends have been on vacation for a long time now. How long has it been? Uh, how long has it since he had been let out of his room? 2785 hadn't been keeping track. A week? A month? It couldn't have been that long. He made some fro progress on the first three floors. But he wouldn't even show a pig anything above that. He didn't even have the lights working. SCP-2794 put a thought away in his mind. To be a thought for later. For now, there was work to be done. Should any portion of the AO3 generator become dysfunctional due to overuse, it is simple to repair provided the essential replacement parts. First, make sure the generator is powered off. SCP-2785 put the manual down for a second. He examined the generator until he found the switch labeled on slash off. He found the switch pointed towards the on side. 2785 put the, put the switch onto the off position before going to the, returning to the manual. Next, open the panel labeled maintenance and look inside of the generator. Visually identify any components that are damaged. Using a Phillips head screwdriver, remove these components, then replace it with functional components. After opening up the panel, SCP-2785 visually identified several wires that had burned out, as well as one of the motors. SCP-2785 had a screwdriver attached to his hand, so he removed all those components and quickly replaced them with ones he had found in the storage room. Once everything looked intact, he closed the panel and switched the generator on. After a few seconds of delay, the lights above flickered, then came on. As SCP-2785 turned off, you see an eye dark here. Many other lights and buildings flicker, then come on. He also heard beeping. Did he forget to unplug a few things? Darn. How long has it been? SCP-2785 had to remember since... He wasn't really keeping track. He usually counted by the number of transformations he had gone by. He counted. 1, 2, 3, 24. That was quite a few. But how much time has it... Was it in between each transformation? SCP-2785 remembered that he had used to have a year in between each transformation. But he had been transforming an awful lot lately. lately. Maybe there was a week between. 2785 decided to go with that answer in order to keep his sanity. I'm not alone. Am I? The thoughts kept racing inside of SCP-2785's head. Of course he wasn't alone, but he hasn't seen any people lately. He hadn't even seen as much as a mouse, or even a housefly. But he wasn't alone. 2785. Remember learning about bacteria, microscopic little buggers. They were everywhere. He couldn't see them. But they were there. They were there. He got that thought in his head. You're alone. The thought came out of the dark. Like a bat coming out of the shadow. The thought even made SCP-2785 drop the table leg he was carrying. And sit it down on the green tilted couch on the break room. His friends were, coming, were going to be back from their vacation soon, right? They've been gone for so long, though. What if... Just what if... They weren't coming back? Well, he had the bacteria, right? But could he talk to the bacteria? Could he have a friendly conversation with bacteria? Could he even be friends with bacteria? SCP-2785 sat down. He thought he'd never be alone. But here he was. Alone. 
4785 picked up the table leg and started to attach it to the couch. And that's it of that story. So what did everyone think of that story? I do believe it was kind of a little sad. At the end. I came in halfway through. It seemed alright. Oh, hey, Bookworm. How are you, Bookworm? Mm -hmm. That the author needs to work on her similes. That's <laughs> all. So, doing alright. Yeah. Yeah, just give me a moment as I pull up the next story. Mainly as blind as this girl <laughs> is kind of blind. Like, okay, author. <laughs> Alright. Okay. Before I read this anomaly, this anomaly is notorious for really fucked up shit. If you're not okay with blood and gore, uh, bats, uh, uh, well, basically, any kind of trigger warning isn't uh, racist. There's no racism in here, I believe. <laughs> but basically, it is really bad. <laughs> so if you're not okay with it, please, please leave for the time being. It is safe to read on Twitch. However, there are things in it that could be triggering. <laughs> you have been warned. Got it. <laughs> Alright. The next one. SCP-001. A.K.A. 
the factory. SCP-001 is an O5's tale. Good evening, Doctor. No, no, don't stand up. And yes, I am who you think I am. Let's not make any more of this than it is. You know my number, and I know you enough that you make a duplicate that even your mother wouldn't be able to tell apart from real you. No, that's not a threat, just a fact. Now, as to my business here, it seems that you've stumbled upon something above your clearance. Well, no, stumbled is not the right word. Dug up, perhaps? And you are getting to the point where further digging would end up in some fairly lethal gunshot wounds. This would be a sad state of affairs, as you are otherwise quite a good researcher. Therefore, you're getting something very few people in the Foundation ever get. An explanation. Yes, we were alerted when you first started digging into SCP-001. Every researcher who's been around for, for a while looks into it. Most are satisfied when they uncover the angel with the flaming sword. It's buried under enough levels. But then you start looking into the factory. And that is when you when I knew you wouldn't stop. So here, here it is, plain and simple. The factory is SCP-001. But it will never be written up. It was a choice I made early on in the creation of the Foundation. And a choice I'll stand by. You researchers are far too curious. I'm not sure which scares me worse. That we'll never understand the factory. Or that one day we will. Ah, well, I'm sure you're eager to learn more. The factory was built in 1835. Back then, it was known as the Anderson Factory, named after James Anderson, a rather well-to-do industrialist. It was built in, well, we'll just say America, and it was the largest factory yet designed. A good mile across at its widest, three stories tall throughout, with a special seven-story tower at the front gate that Anderson lived in. It was designed to be the ultimate factory, capable of taking care of everything, including the housing of workers. People could be born, work, live, and die, without ever leaving the confines of the factory. And work they did, everything from cattle raising and slaughtering, to textiles, to everything else under the sun. Now, no one knows whether James Anderson was actually a Satan worshipper. It's just as likely that he followed some kind of pagan gods. What is known is that he was very exact in the building of his factory and the placement of his machinery within it. Survivors claimed the floor was engraved with arcane symbols that were only visible when blood flowed across them. But when the survivors claimed a lot of things, what is known is that Anderson made his money on the blood and sweat, and sometimes body parts of the lower class. His journals indicate he thought of them as less than human, being put on this earth only to serve his will. Of course, at the time, no one knew about his breed elections, and so people flocked to the factory. A place to both work and live at the same time. Well, of course, people wanted in. Never mind the harsh hours, working conditions, sadistic security force, and all the rest. Factory work workers were forced to work 16-hour days. Work only shutting down on Sundays between sunrise and sunset. Workers were not given individual rooms, instead sharing rooms with eight other people. Sleeping in shifts of three. Medical attention was unheard of. If you're injured in the course of your duties, which most people were, you were expected to just keep working. Anyone too injured to work was dragged off by security, never to be heard from again. For 40 years, the Anderson factory cranked out all sorts of things for people. Meat, clothes, weapons. Never went at the beat. 
beef might be mixed with human. Don't care that the weapons were forged in blood. No attention need be paid to the clothes were dyed with. Well, you get the idea. Rumors leaked out. The products are so good. Why bother? Until someone got out. I never met the brave soul who managed to escape, but she managed to meet the President Grant, and in 1875, he enlisted my aid. At the time, I was, well, it doesn't matter. We'll say I was military, kind of, and that my people were the same. 150 good men and some few women who were often given jobs that, were, that weren't supposed to be common knowledge. We've been cleaning out some of Confederate holdouts and some of the worst things we found down south. So we did some research, didn't like what we saw, and went in, loaded for bear. I don't actually remember much about the night it all went down. Most of it blends together in my head. I get flashes sometimes of the people changed, chained to the line, living next to the dead and damned hard to tell which was which. Children working underneath machines. The majority of the flesh scored, scored off from their bones by the great wheels and cogs and other things. No, I'm all right. I haven't thought about that night for a long time. Security force wasn't much of a problem, but then Anderson's creations showed up. He had been taking the injured workers and, well, experimenting on them. Men, if you could call them men, with multiple arms sewn together. Some of them combined with animals, horrible monstrosities out of mankind's worst nightmares. They kept coming wave after wave of not quite living creatures. I lost a lot of good people that night. And then we found Anderson's breeding pits. Girls as young as eight chained to the walls, forced to be nothing more than... I'm sorry. Even today... More than a century later, the memory makes me see red. When we finally found Anderson cowering in his office, we hung him from his tower window with his own entrails. As he died, he laughed, saying it didn't matter. We, we could kill him, but his factory, the factory would go on. He was still laughing 24 hours later when we finally cut him down, had him drawn and quartered and then burned the remains. The entire time he uttered blasphemies that I don't like to think about. We spent a week cleaning the place out, freeing the workers, putting down the things we found in the basements, and many lightless rooms. We pulled out things that were useful, stocked them in the house near the gate, trying to make sense of everything. 150 of us went into that hell pit that night and only 93 came out. By the end of the week, we are down to 71. But the things we found in there, my God, well, you've seen with the Foundation, well, you've been with the Foundation for a while. They wouldn't seem as amazing to you, but we found toy guns that shot real bullets. A yo-yo that would fray the skin from anyone it touched. Hammers that only worked on human flesh. A breed of skeleton horse that ran faster than anything we'd ever seen. Cloaks that seemed woven from the night itself and let men access a shadowy dimension that I get away from myself. I found tools, both wondrous and horrible, and we were faced with a choice. I gather my highest ranking. Well, we'll call them officers to me, and we try to figure out what we would do. They all had opinions. The chaplain, he had gone a little crazed. Thought all these objects must be miracles sent from God. Holy relics to be worshipped. Marshall and his little toady Dawkins thought there was a fortune to be made here, making and selling these things to the highest bidder. The, the engine we all call Bass, due to his deep speaking voice. He called these things an abomination and declared that we should hunt down and destroy everything we could find. 
if Smith thought we should take this stuff back to the president. The only one without an opinion was the old man. He never said much of anything anyways. We were already for hours, days, trying to work it out. Me, I thought we were sitting on a gold mine, all right. But what we, what we could use these things, these objects, to hunt down some of the scary things we'd run into the south. The other monsters this world had to offer, and use this factory for good. As a place to contain these things, find a way to make them work for our fellow man, or at least protect our fellow man from having to deal with them. I'm sure you can figure out what happened. The chaplain s snuck away in the night with his devotees, taking a couple of small items with him. Marshall was kicked out when we found him abusing his authority. He promised he'd get revenge, and that little Dawkins shit led the rest of their group off with some of the juicier items. Fast as people tried to light the whole damn thing on fire, then just left when it didn't work. And Smith left to report back to the president. I did manage to get him to promise me he'd, he'd tell Grant the factory had been destroyed. I had big plans for that place. Of course, it was kind of hard to follow through on big plans when you only have 12 other people to work with. But it was a start. And it worked for a while. We had these amazing toys, and finding people to work with us was easy. Back then, going off the grid was as simple as leaving town. We knew what we wanted. We knew what we could be. Leventhal set out getting us backing. Someone mentioned here. Someone invested money there. It all worked well. White and Jones sent out getting us other backing. Previous work, we found out some interesting things about people. Some secrets that powerful men didn't want to get in out. And with our new position helping keep these secrets, we got more people asking us to deal with their secrets. Blackmail is a dirty word, but it works. Bright, Argent, and Luminix got to work cataloging these items. Light and Bright's wife, the nurse. They made sure we kept ourselves healthy. <laughs> no, it's just remembering Light. She had such unusual ideas about hygiene for the time. Brilliant woman. Sov, Flesher, and Karnov dealt with training the troops. Tesla and Tamalin were in charge of figuring out how to take advantage of the items without making it obvious. We were amazing. The city we built around the factory, which we took to call on Site Alpha, was self-supporting. Agents, researchers, operatives of all sorts, not by those names, of course, but those positions, we expanded. I'm sorry, I am an old man. I know I do not look it, but the body lies. The mind doesn't always remember right, and sometimes I get lost in my memories. Things get confused, but the long and simple of, of it is this. We use the factory. It always seemed to have more empty rooms to store things in. Back then, that was the word for them, things. No skips then, no. We thought we had a factory tamed. That's one of the reasons I refuse to quit this job. If there's anything I can do here, it's remind people that we will never tame these things. Contain them, yes. But as, as we saw with Abel, tame them, never. After a decade or so, we were pretty organized. The 13 original of us were being called by numbers, not names. We knew how to make things work, and if a thing or two vanished inside the factory still, any occasional D-class, what? Yes, we had D-class back then, disposables. That's where the D comes from. Had to have someone to test things on. Tesla and Tamerlan were both firm about that, but yes, sometimes we lost people. Who didn't matter. Adam, sorry, Dr. Bright was fond of saying it was the factory taking its toll. You can't get something for nothing. 1911 was when it all went wrong. Things. We called them fairies. An entire race of things living beside us. They could look the same as you or I. The only obvious difference was an allergy to iron. Yes, that's why we call them fairies. Now you haven't heard of them, why? 
because it's the one time the Foundation wiped out an entire race of things, root and branch, and I'm the one who did it. We had been hunting them for some time. We'd run into them a time or two before they come out on top. So when a certain royal asked us for help, of course we were eager to get them in our debt. We'd, we've always loved having people in our debt. We sent a team to help out. Take care of what we thought was hunting party. The next time we saw them, their heads were on poles attached to the saddles of the creatures the fairies rode. When they attacked the factory. It was horrible. Three words, but they conveyed so much. I have never... I'm sorry, please give me a moment. I've never told this part to anyone. You should consider yourself lucky. And if you ever tell any, but anyone any of what I'm about to impart on you, I will not just kill you, but everyone who shares your DNA in the worst ways possible. You'll think Procedure 110 Montauk is a walk in the park compared to what I do to you. We lost. The things came, came, and they destroyed us. Rode over our emplacements, slaughtered our people, shrugged off our weapons like they were nothing. I watched my 13 go down left and right, just trying to hold a factory, and I, I their leader, their friend, their father figure, godfather to Bright's four young children, confident, sometimes lover, always as a confessor, I ran. I ran like a scared little schoolboy, deep in the dark guts of the factory. I was chased by the things, I was just one step ahead, I could hear them behind me, feel the breath upon my neck, and I came to a door I'd never seen before, a bronze door covered in Arabic script of some sort. I'd never been one for languages, especially not the curvy bullshit of the muscle men use. But I didn't care. They were coming for me, and I threw the door open and dived through it. Everything inside it was different. There was a feeling of peace that nothing could hurt me here. The light was this dark red, but still felt right. My ears were filled with the steady thrumming of a gigantic heartbeat, and in front of me there were remains of Anderson. It spoke to me then, but I'll be damned if I could tell you exactly what it said. What it told me was more meaning than exact. It offered me hope. It told me, it told me that each of the things we had used from the factory, no matter what we did with them, fed it, helped it grow. Whether the fairies took the factory, they would destroy it. And we couldn't have that. It offered me a deal. It could remove this event, make it, it have never happened. All I needed to give it was us. I didn't want to. I knew it was a bad idea, but then I saw them again. My family. My friends. Dead. Dead by the hands of those bastards. I agreed. It smiled, and I found myself once more upon the ramparts watching a horde of fairies crest the hill. My foundation live once more, and my hands was a weapon. I won't bore you with the details, but we slaughtered them. And with these new weapons, continue to slaughter them everywhere they lived, everywhere they bred. My fellow Ophi's questions my decision, thinking we should save some just in case we might ever need them. I overruled them. We moved away from the factory, shut it down, moved our things out from out of there. We changed the name from things to special containment protocols, focusing on containing them not anything else. The others were curious, but understood I had my reasons. I boarded up the factory, locked it shut, and buried it under a ton of rubble, saying it was too dangerous. I thought, thought I'd gotten away with it until I found a thing on my desk. One of the old toy guns had shot real bullets, and it had the factory label on it. I've sent people in from time to time to see what it might be doing, Last time I sent people in to look, there was nothing there. We keep finding factory items that out there. I can't help but think about how many more we don't find. People who use them and keep it hidden. 
I think back to the body telling me how each item used to ga gave energy to the factory. I never asked it for energy for what. I don't think I want to know. <coughs> what do we give it? D-class, mostly. Where did you think all those bodies went? There's a place. Bodies are left, and they vanish. Everyone thinks I'm a genius for figuring it out. Sometimes, sometimes I have, I have to feed it other things. Researchers, agents, they never know it's coming. It just reaches out and takes them. But in the end, we're doing more good by being here. Whatever the factory wants, whatever it is, we're doing good here. I have to believe that. And now you know. Are you happy? I don't think so. Why I tell you? I'm getting go I'm getting old, Everett. Should I die, someone will have to keep feeding it. Maybe it'll be different. Maybe you'll figure out how to stand up to it. But I doubt it. And that's it. That's it of the factory. <laughs> and I did warn you. Ahead of time, it was gonna get fucked. <laughs> I did warn you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing you were not prepared once I started talking about the children in the factory. <laughs> were you? It took me a little off guard yet. <laughs> So, before I continue the story, um... Hold on, let me get his name again. How do you feel about James Anderson, bookworm? <laughs> How do you feel about James Anderson? Indifferent. <laughs> Anyways, the next story is going to be a mission, more of a mission log like story, but it's going to be what happened to Site 13. Basically, to give you a little bit more of a background, there was this head doctor, I forgot his name. I wonder if it shows in here. Uh, 
But no, it does not show his name. God damn it. We might find out later. But there's a... There's a doctor who believed... That in constantly doing these tests, if the anomalies didn't prove... Uh... To what he wanted... He would either incinerate or shoot them down. And then toss them into a pit. Then there was a bit of a rebellion and it ended in a, another reality. Or the foundation found it. I believe in this log, you'll, you'll find out what happened to him, though. If not, I'll explain. Went after it. As far as I'm aware, I think oh, it was over a hundreds of SCPs that were killed by him. Basically, he was doing a GOC. <laughs> but anyways, are we ready for the next story? Not a thing. It's more information on it, but still a story. Alright, I will now play the audio file. Well, first I read. Addendum 1730.6 receives audio transmission. The following audio transmission was picked up on monitoring equipment of, on the morning of February 1st, 2016. The transmission, both speech and an encrypted signal that followed, has been repeating on a continuous loop since it was first detected. The contents of this transmission are accessible below. Hello. My name is Dr. Muhammad Scott, and I am a researcher within the SCP Foundation's Site 13 Temporal Studies Division. Myself and my team were abandoned within Site 13 during a recent catastrophic event, the full details of which we do not know. We are currently surrounded by hostile entities and other hazardous anomalies. Of the original 30 members of my team, only 12 remain. To any Foundation operatives listening on this channel, we are asking for assistance. Our supplies are dangerously low, as is our ammunition. Without aid, it is unlikely that we will last more than another month. Following this message will be an encrypted, adjusted BMS transmission, decipherable by standard 1980s Foundation technology. The information within that transmission will contain our location as well as we can describe it. The transmission is wired by Deadman's switch to myself and will be played on a continuous loop until such time that I die. Please help us. Thank you. Addendum 1730.7 Updated Exploratory Memorandum In light of recent information gathered by Foundation surveillance teams, it has been deemed pertinent to once again send exploration and recovery teams into Site-13 by the order of the Overwatch Command. SCP-1730's containment procedures have been updated. Mobile Task Force Tal-5, a.k.a. Sam Sara, is currently under the consideration for deployment. Details to follow. To those wondering what MTF Task Force Tal-5 Sam Sara is, it's basically humans that are given the flesh of a god. And basically come demigods. Alright. Not to just this explain it before continuing on. Addendum 1730.8 Exploration and Recovery Log Transcripts Exploration Video Log Transcript Date Redacted Exploration Team Test 
Orbital Task Force Apollo 3 Game Wardens. Subject SCP-1730, Team Lead AP-3 Ross. Team Members AP-3 Houston, AP-3 Noah, AP-3 Ohalo, and AP-3 Virg. If I go. Begin Log. AP-3 Ross. Radio's live. Everything good? AP-3 Virgo. Hang on. Site command. 60 seconds to insertion. AP-3 Ross. AP-3 Ross. Copy. Vigo, you good? AP-3 Vigo. Yeah, I got it. AP-3 Ross. We set. AP-3 Houston. We're good. AP-3 Ross. Alright. Stay cool. Keep your lights on. And if you see anything suspect, hit your visors and give everyone else the heads up. Remember, the internal typography of this place is unstable. If there's a pretty good chance we'll get separated. If we do, stay put until the place stabilizes, and somebody will pick you up. Use your broadcasters if nobody is responsive. And shoot anything that moves. Unless it's one of us. Probably. AP-3 Noah. Then definitely shoot. Team laughs. Sight command. 30 seconds to insertion. AP-3 Ross. Houston, you take the lead. Our information justice entrance leads down to a pretty long staircase. But there shouldn't be any other doors we encounter until we hit the bottom. So we should be more or less safe until we get there. Got it. AP-3 Houston. Got it. AP-3 Ross. Any other questions? Oh, hello. You're quiet back there. AP-3 Ohalo. I'm good, Bass. AP-3 Ross. Alright, that's what I want to hear. Site command. 10 seconds to insertion. AP-3 Vigo. Here we go. Pause. Site command. Game wardens, you are clear to begin operation. AP-3, Ross. Let's roll. Team enters SCP-1730. As expected, initial interior space is a long descending staircase. AP-3, Houston takes lead. Site command. Team, we're monitoring you from here. But let us know if you hear, see, or any, or see, or experience anything unexpected. AP-3 Ross. Copy. Team descends for three minutes. Interior of SCP-1730 is unlit, with only luminescent coming from the shoulder-mounted lights of MTF AP-3. AP-3 Ross. How are we looking? AP-3 Houston. Pretty good, we... I see a door up here, on a landing. AP-3 Ver Vigo. I see it. AP-3 Ross. Alright, that's unfortunate. A hollow. Keep... Noah, keep an eye on our backs when we pass it. Hang on. Team stops at the landing. AP-3 Houston tries the door, but it is locked. AP-3 Ohalo. There's air blowing under the door here. See where the dust is kicked up? AP-3 Ross. Yeah, my go. Let's see that thermal camera. AP-3 Vigo. Alright, hang on. 
Here it is. Ten seconds of silence. AP3 Ross. Yeah, no, I don't. Radio static. Not even going to begin to fuck with that. Let's keep going. Site command. Team lead. You copy? Is everything alright? EP3 Ross. Uh, yeah. We're good. Still descending. Site command. Affirmative. Just got some static. Wanted to make sure you were good. Team continues to descend for three more minutes. AP3 Ohalo. Light. Look. AP3 Ross. Yeah. Man, there's a light up ahead. Might be our exit. Eyes open. Team descends for two minutes. AP3 Noah. Shit. AP3 Vigo. Whoa, what the fuck is that? AP3 Ross. God damn it. Alright, Command. Be advised that the bottom of the stairwell is just missing. I don't know where the light we saw is coming from, but if we go down about three more steps, we're in a sort of void. I don't see a bottom to it. Site Command. Copy that. Hang tight, team. We're taking a look at this. AP3 Ohalo. What if we drop something in it to see how far it goes? AP3 Fico. I mean, I can, I can see how far it goes. And it sort of looks like forever. AP3 Ohalo shrugs. Site command. Game wardens, go ahead and proceed back up. We'll see about another insertion point. AP3 Houston. Damn it. AP3 Ross. It's alright, we'll just... AP3 Vigo. Ross, look, it's not a void, it's a liquid. It's just not reflecting light, like, at all. It's pitch black. AP3 Houston. Looks sort of like water. AP3 Ross. Hang on. Yeah, we're not gonna fuck with that either. Command, how far are we to the bottom of the stairwell? Site command. One moment. You're about 15 meters below where we expected the stairwell to end. AP3 Ross. Stellar. The typography is off here. Let's head back up a ways and see if we can find a different exit. Site command. Team lead, hold position for a moment. We're trying to determine your location right now. AP3 Noah. Hey, Chief. AP3 Ross. Hold on. AP3 Noah. No, look up, it's... AP3 Ross. Shut up. I'm... AP3 Houston. Oh, fuck, it's rising. AP3 Ross. Shit. Alright, boys. Time to go. Fuck. Black Wickwood begins to quickly rise behind MTF AP3. Team quickly... The team moves quickly up the stairwell in relative silence. AP3 Vigo. It's gaining on us. Fuck. Come on. AP3 Houston. Jesus Christ, I... AP3 Ohalo. Houston, grab him. Ross, help. AP3 Ross. Shit. Don't. AP3 Houston. My legs. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Fuck my way. My legs. I. B3 Noah. There's another door up here. Hurry! AP3 Ross. Hang on. Team enters the door to the next landing. Door is slammed closed. AP3 Noah. 
Wait, Jesus, what happened to his legs? V3 Ross. Shit, Houston, how are you? A three three Houston. I uh wait. V three Figo. What? Site command. What's happening? Do you read us? A P three Ross. Yes. Sorry, command. That all happened quickly. Houston fell coming up to the stairs and got his legs covered in that stuff. And now they're just gone. One clean cut. Like they weren't there. AP3 Houston. I can actually still feed them, guys. Like, I can see they're not there, but it doesn't hurt. And I think I can stand up. AP3 Ohalo. What the fuck? AP3 Houston proceeds to stand up. He is missing his legs from the knees down, but appears to be floating as if they were still there. AP3 Figo waves his hand underneath Houston's legs, which passes through the space and unimpended. AP3 no- uh, AP3 Ross. Alright, so there's that. You aren't hurting Houston? AP3 Houston. Nothing feels different. AP3 Ross. Okay, that's fucking crazy. Command, do you know anything about this? Saint Command. Negative. B3 Ross. Alright. Let's keep going. Then Command. It looks like we're we're in a maintenance hallway or something similar. We've got pipes running up and down the walls and gate gauge as such. It's pretty warm here. B3 Ohalo. There, on a wall. What happened to Site 13? Three Ross. It's a recurring phrase that keeps sh showing up written on the walls here. Command, do we not know that's not a meme? Saint Command. It isn't. None of the studies we ran uncovered any anomalous effects related to that phrase. We're still not sure why we keep finding it, though. AP3 Ross. Noted. Down this hall. Team continues in silence for four minutes. During this time, AP3 Noah's camera su disconnects suddenly. This information was not promptly related related to the task force. AP3 Houston. There's something up ahead, see? There, at the corner. AP3 Vigo. Is that a person? AP3 Ross. Approach with caution. Safety's off. Team approaches the target in silence. Upon, upon reaching the target, video feed shows a severely disfigured, rotting human corpse. Age unknown, partially conjoined to the wall behind it. Several other spatial distortions are evident nearby, such as the ceiling and wall appearing to pull back into each other. But this is unnoticed by AP3. AP3 Ross. Ah, shit. Good to finally see a familiar face. Guys, it's just Zachary. AP3 Ohalo. Thank God. Zachary, how did you get down here? Silence. AP3 Houston. Us too, man. This place is fucked up. Look at my fucking legs, man. Look at this shit. Sight Command. Team, le team lead, please be advised that you are under the effects of a powerful cognito hazard. We are attempting to unlo upload a filter to your scramble visors. One moment. AP3 Fico. Nah, man, it's alright. It's just Zachary. We go way back, don't we, buddy? AP3 Fico playfully punches the corpse, dislodging its jaw. The corpse does not respond. AP3 Ross. Zachary. We're looking for some other people trapped in here. Do you know how to get to the lower levels? Silence. 
AP3 Ohalo. Shit. P3 Ross. Okay, okay. So wait, what's below that? Silence. AP3 Ross. Uh-huh. Silence. AP3 Houston. Shit, he's right. Where's Noah? The team turns and AP3 Noah is not seen. AP3 Ross. Ah, shit. Zachary, stay here. Noah, do you read me? Noah, it's Ross. Do you hear me at all? Command, where the fuck is Noah? Site command. That is, that's uncertain. Team lead, be advised. The upload is complete. Please restart your visors for the filter to take effect. Team restarts their visors. AP dash AP three Ross. There we go. What was it that? Oh, gross! Man, there's a body in the wall down here. So it's been fused into it or something. The visors are ticking like crazy too. Site command acknowledged. Team lead, proceed. AP. -th Dash three Houston. Wait, look back there. Y you see shimmering. AP three Vigo. Is that gas? It looks like a gas leak. AP three Ohalo. No, look at the floor. Look behind it. Fuck, fuck. AP three Houston. Shit. No, a shit. Approaching MTF AP3 is a shimmering, transparent, humanoid construct, apparently the source of the spatial anomalies in this area. As his feet touch the ground, the floor begins to warp within space around them, stabilizing after the entity passes by. MTF AP Noah is visible, hanging by the entity, though the nature of this agent is uncertain. As a spatial anomaly, he is... Caught in appears to be extremely severe, and very few of his features can be made out. Noah is seen attempting to move slightly, but continues to be twisted by the anomaly as it moves. AP3 Ross. Fucking shoot it, goddammit! Open, open fucking fire, shit! MTF AP3 fires on the entity. As the bullets approach, their trajectory changes in a twist and spin around, an around the entity before falling harmless on the floor or lodging in the ceiling. AP3 Ohalo. This isn't working, Chief. We. AP3 Vigo. You know, I'm shit! AP3 Vigo is seen turning and attempting to pull away from an unseen force. From AP3 Ohalo's camera, a long, shimmering, transparent appendage is seen stretching towards AP3 Vigo, extracting the wall closest to it as it moves. It wraps around AP3 Vigo's left arm, which begins to visibly distort. Vigo screams. AP3 Ross. Houston, the anchor! AP3 Houston. Oh, yeah. AP3 Houston produces a miniature portable sprint and reality anchor, which he powers on and, lo and lobs towards the entity. There is a flash of red light, and for a split second, the entity becomes visible as an extremely disfigured, grotesquely elongated humanoid, which exists for only a second before the spatial distortions surrounding it are anchored and violently reset, creating a massive pressure wave in the confined space. The team is momentarily incapacitated. P3 Vigo. Oh, my arm. AP3 Vigo's left arm is bright red, but otherwise unscathed. AP3 Ohalo assesses it. AP3 Ohalo. I thought it would go away. It's just the anchor cooling down. You good? P3 Vigo. Yeah, alright. Thanks. P3 Ross. 
Jesus, Noah. Noah, are you there? Silence. AP3 Ross. Can any of you see Noah? AP3 Vigo. Ross, here, look, in a while. As dust clears, AP3 Noah becomes visible, partially fused with the walls, ceiling, and floor. Across 10 meters of hallway, the agent is unmoving. AP3 Houston, wretches. AP3 Ohalo, indistinct muttering. AP3 Ross, God, come on. Do you read me? Hello? Site command. We read you, team lead. AP3 Ross. We lost Noah. He's in the wall. Do you want us to proceed? Site command. One moment. Silence. Site command. Team lead, do you feel... As if returning to the surface would be more dangerous than continuing your mission. AP3 Ross. I I have no f way of knowing that. We have no way of knowing what's in here. Everything in here is so fucked. It's incredible. I don't even know if we can get back. If we wanted to. None of the other teams have, have they? Site command. That is correct. AP3 Ross. Honestly, whatever happens down here can't be any worse than whatever we'd see on our way back. It probably doesn't make a difference. Whatever. Let's keep going. Site command. Affirmative. Team lead. We are preparing another team eight to evacuate in the event that you reach your target. Searching time is in four hours. AP3 Ross. You're sending another task, task force in here. What idiots volunteer for that gig? Site command. Samsara. AP3 Ross. Uh oh. Alright, cool. I copy. Team continues on for a short time, unimpeded. They pass through several other areas, including a ransacked infirmary. A cafeteria space melted into slag and a wing of containment units, identified as Olympia class. They are no less than 100 meters in height. Eventually, the team enters a room off the main hallway. It appears to be a telecommunications center. A single television is illuminated on the wall across from them. EP3 Houston. This is weird. P3 Ross, stay cool guys, search this room, see if there's anything we can collect that they could use topside. P3 Vigo. These, these terminals have power, I'll collect the backup. There's a sound on the other end of the room, like static. A hollow in Houston moved towards the illuminated television. AP3 Ohalo. Is something broadcasting through this? The screen flickers and an image appears. The interior of a standard containment cell is shown. Though it is devoid of any comforts or belongings, a single red light behind the camera is on, poorly illuminating the space. A long figure is huddled, huddled in the corner. AP3 Houston. Hang on. Is that? AP3 Ohalo. Holy shit, it is. AP3 Ross. What is it? AP3 Houston. It's Bobble the fucking clown. At the mention of the name, the figure in the corner looks towards the camera. Unidentified figure. What? What do you want? Who is it? AP3 Ross. Jesus. My name is Ephraim Ross. I'm an agent with the... Actually, hang on. Who?
Who are you? The figure shifts sideways, and more of its body becomes visible through the darkness. The red light illuminates its eyes, though little else of the figure can be made out. Unidentified figure. Hmm, you're different. You smell different. You know I can smell you, even from here. You don't know that, though. They did, but you're not like them. They went great lengths to figure that out. They know, they know, they know. They will know. <laughs> AP3 Ross. You're Bobble the Clown. Yeah. The figure slides slowly across the wall of the cell. Just out of range of the red light, its movements are noticeably erratic. It comes closer to the camera. Unidentified figure. They had a number for me once when I was Bobble. My friends didn't like the number, so I identif so we identified with the numbers. Mmm, I am not Bobble, but I am the thing that used to be Bobble. You're not you're not where you're supposed to be, gun buddy. You don't match the air in here. You're out of place just like I am. Just like we were. AP3 Ross. Uh-huh. What happened here? Unidentified figure. Teddy Emerson played a tricky little game with the strings of the universe. He walked on in like a tightrope and was surprised when he fell. Tricky little Emerson. Then just went back. Says, no, 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 no. He went back. Full ideas, ideas like pain or death. We were tired to stack those boxes on the string and broke the whole thing, making tumbling down with them. <laughs> AP three Ross. How many other entities are in here? What else do you know? Unidentified figure. How many? <laughs> How many entities are stopped by site 13? <laughs> you silly, you silly, silly out of place, boy, silly little boy. Everything made its way into site 13. If the foundation could find it, and the collation couldn't catch it. It was fed into the meat grinder down there. Everything. They mulched us all. There was nothing to gain. Some got lucky. Bob got lucky. Stuff in a funny box to play. And played with, toys with, ex toyed with, experimented with, to see what sounds they made when he wanted to die. Others was not so lucky. <laughs> they burned the library, you know. Held it upside down in a can of soup. And let the contents run out of the furnace and burn the whole place up. They did other things, too. Worse things. Danny Emerson liked it. <laughs> we watched it all every time. Got his jollies off watching it. <laughs> AP3 Ross. AP3 Ross. What worse things? The unidentified figure approached the camera and comes fully into view, illuminated by the red light. A significant portion of its body is distorted by video static that moves as, as it moves. The static appears to be cutting into the tissue of the figure's body, creating large lacerations that ooze a dark yellow liquid. As it moves, the figure appears to be slowing off large portions of its mass, which are replaced with static. Half of its face sloughs off as it nears the camera, and one eye becomes shrouded in static. Unidi unidentified figure. Every worse thing. <laughs> AP3 Vico. Chief, we're picking something up on the radio. I think it's a survivor signal. We must be getting close. AP3 Ross. Alright, let's keep moving. Unidentif unidentified figure. Have fun, boys. Don't let the dead bugs bite. <laughs> if you see Daddy Anderson down there, rape him to death for me. AP3 team passes out of the tunnel communications room and into the main hallway. 
following the strength of the signal discovered by AP3 Vigo, they near an area that appears to be a cryogenic containment unit, similar to those utilized in the defunct cryogenics Y Wing of Site 19. As they pass through this area, command loses the signal of each member of the team, with only intermittent static being broadcast. This continues for 30 minutes before a signal is received again. AP-3 Houston. Command! Command! Are you there? Do you read me? Snipe to command. Houston, we read you. Are you alright? Is everyone alright? AP-3 Houston. Oh, shit. Thank God. We've been trying to reach you forever. Yeah, we found the survivors. They're holed up down here. I don't uh, here in I don't know what you call this place, but it's not conductive to habitation. We're looking at twenty, maybe thirty people. We found some other agents of ours too, a few mall rats, and a guy from Travelers. They all ended up down here. Site command, are you prepared to evac? AP three Houston. Uh, yeah. So that's not gonna happen the way you think, not the way I think we wanted to. Not currently. It's a whole lot worse here than we anticipated. Command, I don't know how they ever lock some of this shit up. But suffice to say, that every single containment cell is broken open. And this shit is real. Like, really real. We keep hearing things down the halls nearby. I think whatever is down there is looking for us. I think they're angry. If they find us, we don't have enough bullets to keep them down. Let alone get these people out. Site command. Where's Where's Ross? AP3 Houston. He's trying to get some defenses ready with the others in case they come tonight. It's not looking good, you know. I don't know if you guys have a backup plan, but we'll take any ideas. Site command. How long have you been down there? AP3 Houston. Uh, maybe three days? Site command. Affirmative. All three team, be advised that, you're, that we are activating and asserting Tau-5 for rescue and recovery. AP-3 Houston. Look, yes. Tell them to hurry. Ext Extraction and recovery video log transcript. Date redacted. Exploration team, all task force Tau-5, Sansara. Subject, SCP-1730. Team lead, T-5 Arantu. Team members, T-5 Monru, T-5 Onru, T-5 Nanku. Notes. The following is an audible slash video transcript of, of an extraction and recovery mission carried out by the members of Mole Task Force Tau 5 Samsara after contact by NTF AP3 Game of Wardens with human survivors within SCP 1730. The AP3 team had requested assistance in extracting the survivors due to large numbers of hostile entities within the site. Each member of MTF Tau 5 was outfitted with a number of cybernetic enhancements per the specification of their design, including arm mounted incendiary cannons, shock absorbing leg extensions, heat resistant plating, built in scrambled adaptations within the eyes, and others. Tau 5's assertion point was a drainage gate near a secondary entrance that the AP 3 team had inserted through. Begin log. Tau 5 Arantu. We're plugging in. Site command. Can you hear me? Site command. We do. 60 seconds to insertion. Tau, Tau 5 Nanku. So, how dangerous should this mission be considered? Tau 5 Monru. Not a single person they sent in has come out yet. Considerably. Tau 5 Nanku. Acknowledge. This should be engaging. 
Tower 5, a run to. Team, check your optics. Last thing we need is somebody succumbing to a mimetic hazard. Tower 5, not good. Understood. I'm good. Tau 5, Monru. Also good. Tau 5, Anru. I'm good. Tau 5, Arantu. Good. Remember, all we're looking to do here is extract the survivors. We're not attempting to contain anything, so you see something nasty, put it down. Tau 5, Nunk. As always, Tau 5, I don't need to be convinced. Fight command. Team, you are about... You are 30 seconds to insertion. Sight command. 10 seconds to insertion. Sight command. Tau 5, you are clear to begin extraction and recovery. Tau 5, Arantu. Gale. Tau 5 team enters SCP-1730 through the drainage gate under the secondary office structure. Each team member activates their shoulder-mounted lamp. Illuminating the tunnel. After a short time, the team reaches another gate. Several large drainage pipes are visible behind the gate. Tau 5 Monroe. Look, up against the gate, bodies. No fewer than 20 charred humanoid forms in varying stages of destruction are pushed up against the bottom of the gate. Several arms are pushed through the gate and are reaching out towards the tunnel. Tau 5 Nanku. These look very burned. Where do you think they came from? Tau 5 Arantu. I had to say, I can't imagine they would they would have made it, it far in this condition. Tau 5 Monroe. There's an incinerator near here, right? Near the body pit we keep hearing about? Maybe they came from there. Tau 5 Nanku. Uh, Tau 5 Nanku. An incinerator? Tau 5 Arantu. As good as a place to start as any, let's get those pipes there. Tau 5 team cuts through the gate and scales the wall behind it to the lar largest of three drainage pipes. Team continues on for a short time. Tau 5 en route. The temperature is rising. Tau 5 Arantu. I notice it as well. We must be getting close. Tau 5 Munru. We're descending right now, too. This is strange. Shouldn't a drainage pipe run out, not in? Tau 5 Nunk. Maybe. Maybe it's affected by the topographical and abnormalities. Tau 5 Arantu. Likely. Tau 5 Onru. Arantu, the wall is weak here. I can hear echoing from the other side of it. Tau 5 Arantu. What's over there? Tau 5 Onru. Hang on. Hallway, I think. Tau 5 Arantu. I see. Alright, we'll split up here. Munru, you, and Nanku see where this tunnel leads out. Onru and I will go through this wall and see what's on the other side. Tau 5 Nanku. And if we get killed... Tau 5 Arantu. Don't get killed. Tau 5 Naku. Understood. Tau 5 team splits up with Tau 5 Naku and Monru following drainage pipe towards the source of the heat. And Tau 5 Arantu and Anru going through the thin wall to the hallway beyond. Arantu and Anru manage to break down the concrete wall between the drainage pipe and hallway beyond. Within the hallway, there are several bare offices, barely lit up by dim overhead lights. The entire area appears to have been abandoned for some time. Iruntu and Anru look for an elevator on stair, stair access, but find nothing. After a short time, Anru finds a door that, op that opens into a control room. A large glass obfuscation window is obscured by some dark material. Many of the controls in this room had been destroyed. Tau 5 Anru. This is the control room for the incinerator, see? It says incinerator number 1. Over there and below it, it says body pit 
access below. Tower 5 or I've never heard of a furnace that needs its own control room. What's blocking the window here? Blast shields? Tower 5 on room. No. No. These are bodies. And garbage. Refuse. Congealed and flagulated. Look, you can see the faces. Tower 5 or on 2. I see it. Our intel said that one of the engineers had blocked up the drainage pipes out of, out of here. Now I can are probably gonna go, going to run into that. I wonder if there's another way down from here. I thought we'd be able to go down through the incinerator. Tower 5, Anru. Hang on. Anru proceeds to look over the controls on a relatively undamaged controller near the observation window. As she does, Nanku and Runru appear at the door. Tower 5, Monru. It's blocked. Something has turned the end of, the, of that pipe into slag. We try to punch through it, but it's pretty thick. Tower 5, Nanku. I broke my hand on it. Look. Holds up her hand, which is undamaged. It was broken, I mean. Tower 5, Arantu. Quiet. Anru is looking for something. Tower 5, Anru. Got it. Anru throws a large switch and turns several nearby knobs. There is an immense groaning sound and a mass in front of the, of the window begins to spin slowly. Tower 5, Nanku. Interesting. There is a jolt as if something had bro has broken free, and a mass begins to spin rapidly and slowly descend. There is a distinct sound of a turbine spooling up. The team's internal temperature gauges begin to register a steady increase in heat. Tower 5, Munro. It's dropping. Look down there, see? The mass has, has cleared the window, revealing a massive centrical chamber on the other side, at least 300 meters in diameter, and roughly 400 meters deep. At the center of the chamber is a massive shaft, extending the full height of the chamber, attached to several large turbines. As the turbines spin, no matter the matter within the chamber is turned into a slurry. Near the top of the chamber are several pilot lights. Large holes are present around the outside of the chamber. Tower 5, Anru. Alright, and then... Anru throws another switch, and the, and the pilot lights are ignited. Enormous streaks of fire cascade down from the ceiling of the chamber, scorching the mass below. Additional jets of flame begin to emit from the walls of the chamber. Mm -hmm. Tower 5, Anru. Look, down near the bottom, there's a Sulai gate. That looks like it's leading away from here. Over there, see? Can you get that door open? Tower 5, Anru. Yes. Got it. A large circular door opens near the bottom of the pit, above the level of the matter within. Tower 5, Anru. Excellent. Though, I don't... I still don't know how you think... We're going to get in there. The pipe is black. Naku extends her arm and fires several rounds of from a wrist-mounted projectile weapon at the glass window in front of them. The glass cracks and shatters, exposing the room around them to the heat of the chamber. Tau 5 Monru. Straightforward. Tau 5 Naku. One does what one can. The team enters the incinerator and jumps down onto the ledge below, near another drainage pipe. They make their way through the vast chamber, avoiding the spinning blades and ever-descending biological slurry around them. Tau 5, Manru. Something unpleasant took place here. Tau 5, Nanku. Oh? Tau 5, Manru. Yes, in fact... All of this has to be draining somewhere, likely out below us, through one of the- of those fissures. Tower 5 or run 2. We won't have time to find out, 
We'll follow this pipe down and see where it goes. Team enters the open door and descends down a drainage pipe a short distance before it empties into a large cistern. The team enters the cistern, which is lit from above by a small, large glowing plant-like structure. Tau 5 Nanki. Interesting. What do you think that is? Tau 5 Anru. I... I don't know. The sound of their voices, the growing structure begins to shake slowly, and thousands of glowing spinning pods are released from its body. As they fall, they brightly illuminate the entire chamber. Tau 5 Monryo. Look, the shadows! The glowing pods create vaguely humanoid shadows on the walls of the cistern, which act in an anomalous manner. These shadows appear to reach their hands up or forward, as if toward the team. As the pods reach the slurry below, they extinguish and the shadows disappear. Tau 5 Arantu. Alright, which way do we go? Tau 5 Monru. This is the drainage pipe leading away from the incinerator. The incinerator is underneath the power station, which is the east of the compound. So, far as we can tell, we need to go northwest from there. So, hang on, look over there. Tau 5 Nanku. At what? Tau 5 Monru. At the wall, something is seeping through it. Was that there before? Tau 5 Anru. No. Tau 5 Arantu. It's black and shiny and definitely seeping. Something is pushing through. Tau 5 Nanku. What does that mean? What is it? Drainage? Tau 5 Monru. Unlikely. It's probably some runoff from Reactor or Tau 5. Unru. No, it's blood. It's leeches. Tau 5 Arantu. What? Tau 5 Unrun. Unru. Look. Unru points at the spot on the wall, illuminated by their shoulder mounted lamps. At the spot, a thick flow of black liquid is seeping through the cracks in the wall, and something small is wriggling within the crack. The team zooms in on the spot, revealing a small, right, earthly, writhing leech, pushing its way through the spot. It breaks through and falls to the ground. Tau 5 Nanku. Ha! Huh, it's a leech. What does that mean? Tau 5 Monru. Nothing good. The small leech moves towards the biological slurry at the, their feet and begins to ingest it. As it does, the leech slowly begins to grow in size. Tau 5 Munru. More of them in the wall. They're pushing through. Team looks back toward the wall where several spouts of black fluid are beginning to pour through the various cracks along its surface. Several more small leeches are squirming through those through these cracks. Tau 5 around 2. Anru, what do you see? Tau 5, Anru. There's something below us. It's huge. Covering in other people's blood. Reaching up towards us. These are like fingers. that all They all communicate back to the host. The... Bring me a leech. Tau 5, Anru. What? Tau 5, Nanku. You're kidding. Tau 5, Anru. No, bring me one. They're telepathic. They're communicating that way. I need a leech. Iranto moves across the room before grabbing a leech off the ground. As he pulls it away from the liquid, it struggles and squirms, biting several large chunks out of his hand. Tau 5 Iranto. Peculiar. Here. Tau 5 Onro. Alright, one moment. Anru extends her left hand towards the leech, which opens up to reveal a series of long, delicate, metallic rods and pointed tips. She maneuvers the rods on, into the flesh of the creature, near the base of the brain. Tau 5, Anru. There, let's see. They heard the incinerator activate. They're hungry. They're coming up here to eat. A lot of them. 
The house is down below us, but I can't see that far down. If I look at the neural activity of the entire network of entities, I can map out the areas they're in. Let's see if I can do something with that. There we go. You should all have it on your retinas now. Tau 5 Arantu. Clever. Tau 5 Naku. So we're looking at, at a map. It seems too distorted to be a map. Tau 5 Arantu. Uh, Tau 5 Onru. Ongoing topographical changes means that despite the changes in the structure of the site, it is all still lo located within our, our local reality. It's just unstable. Tau 5 Munru. Do we know where this Thresher device is? Tau 5 Onru. Probably something to do with this section here. If you follow a logical structural design plan based on the, on the evidence provided in this map, there should be a whole extra wing here. But there aren't any leeches down that way. Yes, I can see a conduit running to that area. That's where a thresher machine is. Silence. Tau 5 run to. What about our recovery? Tau 5 Anru. This area here. Several corridors lead to a large research wing, but most of them have been blocked off. Every now and then, one of the ends of the network goes dark here. The survivors are in there. Tau 5 Arantu. What's the fastest way in from where we're at now? Tau 5 Arantu. But, goddammit. Tau 5 Anru. One moment. Three paths to choose from. Each with different potential hazards. The first takes us further down this pipeline until we reach a waste treatment faculty within the plant. This is the longest route, but from that, the facility is fairly direct shot towards the survivors. The second path drops us into a cistern below this, which leads us directly to the large chamber here. The leech is in there. I can hear it right now. It's wondering why one hasn't come back. Tau 5 Arantu. And the third? Tau 5 Arant Anru. The third route takes us through the area here, which is. which is, uh. which is clear. I can hear the leeches as. as they move around the site. They are noisy, uncoordinated, acting on impulse without much finesse. But in this area, They've all very, very quiet. They can go in and out for something, but they do it very, very quietly. Tau 5 Nanku. Look at this leech. It's the size of a cat already. Tau 5 Manru. Are there any other, other entities in there? Tau 5 Anru. I can't tell. The leeches follow a single path in and a single path out. They don't stray from it, and they don't look around. Tau 5 Arantu. Which is the fastest path? The last, uh, Tau 5 Arantu. On the la last one's the fastest. We follow the tunnel towards the service door and follow the staircase down, uh, uh, staircase towards the bottom. Once we're there, there's another hallway off to the left that takes us past the area, or through it. Maybe. And on the other side is the back entrance to, the re to our research wing. Tau 5 Arantu. Alright. That's the one we'll take then. Tau 5 Nanku. Shame. Here I thought we'd be shooting leeches. Tau 5 Arantu. You have plenty of chances too on your way out. We need to get these people out quickly. Anru, does it feel like... The leeches are, are trying to get into the wing where the survivors are. Tau 5 Anru. Yes, there is plenty of blood in the site. But not all of it is still warm. They'll be coming out, coming for them soon. Team leaves cistern and follows drainage pipe west. Eventually, the team reaches a service door lit up by a single fl flickering lamp. 
105, Monroe. There's something written on this door. Blood. 105, Nanku. Here on the, on the wall, too. Look. What's it written in? Tau 5, Arantu. Wait. Tau 5, Anru. Look. Anru amplifies her shoulder, mounted spotlight, illuminating the entire wall of the tunnel. The word blood is repeated over and over, sprawled across the surface of the wall in a thick black substance. Anru turns left, illuminating several dissociated corpses in a corner at the end of the tunnel, all of which are covered in and and seeping the same fluid. Town 5, Namku. Unsettling. Town 5, Arantu. Come on, don't waste time. The team enters the service door, revealing a partial staircase. The stairs above them are intact, but the stairs below have been destroyed. The walls of the stairwell are coated in cracks, through which seep seeps the black liquid. Monroe lights a flare and drops it, and the team watches it fall. After a short time, the flare lands with a slight splash, revealing the floor below. Team 5, Nanku. How large is this site? Team 5, Anru. Site 19 has at least 50 underground floors, and no fewer than 80 individual wings. Considering what we know about Site 13, it's like there's at least twice as many of each. If not more, the Eco's class came at cells alone or as large as the entirety of Site 81. Town 5 Monroe, which means there could be worse things down there nobody has seen yet. Town 5 Arantu, it's almost a certainty. Arantu leaps from the landing and lands near the flare, his implants absorbing the majority of the impact. The rest of the team follows suit. At, at the bottom of the stairwell is another door into a hallway, and the team enters it. Town 5 Arantu. Where to now? Town 5 Anru. About 200 meters down this hallway on the right. There are several security doors, but I think they've all been disabled. Through there is, I think, it's a data storage center. It's a bit. It's big and lined with fence that lead to the cooling to towers at the surface. Where do, where do the leech, leeches? Oh wait, sorry. Tau five Monru. Where do the leeches start acting strange? Tau five Monru. In there. Tau five Monru. Wonderful. Team moves down the hallway. Nanku, at point flanked. By Anru and Monru and Rantu, watching the rear. As they pass, they check each other to see if they are locked. Most doors lead to network maintenance areas. Though notably, one door leads to the telecommunications room, previously visited by AP3 team. One screen on the far wall appears to have been busted from the inside out. Town 5, Nanku. Look here. The door to the server area. Town 5, Monru. What's the door? What's the door there? Town 5, Rantu. It's marked as stairs to cryonics. I guess I'd say it probably goes up to the next level and is seated right on top of this room. Acts as an installation for the data center. Town 5, Monru. Can we go through it? Tower 5, Arantu. Which is faster, Anru? Tower 5, Anru. The only way I can see is through the server room. There weren't any leeches up there. This is very strange. There are certainly plenty of access points to that room. Very strange. Tower 5, Arantu. Through the server room, then come on. Team enters through the door of the server room. They pass through several more security doors, all of which are unlocked. As they do, the external temperature drops severely and st stays steadily at roughly negative 20 degrees Celsius. Everyone two motions for the team to activate their internal heating coils, protecting their internal organs, which damage them to exposure. As the team proceeds down the hall hallways into the server room, terrifies Nanku's scramble 
optical implant. Begins to activate signaling when an anomalous meme is being filtered out. However, Tau5 Nanku has previously disabled the visual cue for the warning on our optical overlay, overlay instead of relying on the audio cue that accompanied the implant. Audio warning does not trigger at all. It is not until the team enters the primarily server room that Tau5 Anru realizes that no sound is audible at all, regardless of the source. Thinking at first that it might be her auditory implant, Anru removes the implant and restarts it. But after establishing that it is functioning properly, she intends to communicate this with Arantu. Arantu motions for the team to hold and attempt to discern the, the source of the anomalous influence. As they do, each other team member receives a warning that their scrambling filters are being triggered. Monroe motions towards the door and they're through. Monroe motions towards the back of the server area towards the research wing. It is during this silent discussion that Nanku notices the movement across the large room, motioning for her teammates to stay still. Each team member begins to hear a quiet whining sound, which slowly glo grows in intensity. As they huddle up, Monroe notices the writing on one of the server racks written in black fluid. It says silence and then don't look. He motions towards the racks and the team acknowledges it. Around two motions for the team to move towards the far wall, and they slowly proceed between the server racks towards the back exit. Suddenly, Unru catches a momentary glimpse of the large entity across the room and stops her teammates from advancing. She looks around the corner and sees the entity again as it comes back into view. The entity is a massive multi-limbed figure. The primary structure of the entity is a floating cross-legged humanoid const construct with six legs, 18 arms, and 36 forearms attached to 72 hands. Each limb moves independently, gesturing and posing in constant sudden jerking movements. The entity does not have a head, but instead has a large, flat circular structure attached to its upper chest that is covered in a large number of symbols and glyphs, which glow with bright light against the entity's dark gray-brown skin. On each of the entity's arms are a gold band attached to a chain which drags the ground when not being pulled around in one of the entity's gestures. The golden bands are etched with glyphs later identified as the powerful anti kinito hazards, though the chains are broken and the anti kinito hazards are inactive. Most notably, a single severely emaciated, severely charged human figure is bound to the flat circular structure of the entity's head. This figure twists against its restraints and appears to be screaming, likely in a whining sound heard from the entity's muting kinito hazard. As the entity performs its gestures, the glyphs on its head illuminates rapidly, often causing burns where the human skin comes in contact with them, creating further distress and increasing the volume of whining. Town 5 Anru also notices that some aspect of the entity is creating a severe malfunction in her optical implants, sensing the circuits responsible for, for handling the scramble calculations. She looks away, ejecting the influence before they, they damage her retinas. The motions to the rest of the Tau 5 team to not look at the entity directly. The team acknowledges and they continue to move forward. Suddenly the whining becomes dramatically louder and begins to draw closer to the team. Monroe drops a pro proximity mine from his pack and then another a short distance away. As they flee from the entity, streaks of blue electricity begin to arc between the server racks, and the ground beneath them begins to shift, as if it was made of sand. As Naku threatens to fall, uh, fall to the ground, there's a muffled wave of pressure behind them as the first proximity mine detonates and the ground solidifies. The team turns a corner and the back entrance of the room comes into view. From above them, and they can see a hole in the ceiling exposed to the cryogenics laboratory. A briefly complicated containment cell is visible, though it is thoroughly destroyed. 
The team moves swiftly towards the door as white hot glyphs begin to appear on the ground beneath them and in the air around them. The team manages to duck and weave through the symbols, but Tail 5 Nanku catches her left arm on a glyph in the air and, and it bursts into flames. Irantu, having seen this from his position behind Nanku, fires his weapon at her shoulder, removing the arm. It falls to the ground and explodes into a cylinder. Munro reaches the door first and throws it open. Anru follows immediately afterwards. Nanku stumbles through, collapsing on the other side, and Arantu comes up last. Just before closing the door, Arantu turns to look at the entity closing in behind them, which was at this point was barely visible blur of gestures, fiery glyphs, and an inhuman whine. As the door swings close, Arantu zooms in on the humanoid figure strapped to the entity's head, enough to see the word Emerson seared into the flesh of the figure. As if from a melted patch of fabric, Arantu slams the door closed and immediately injects his optical implants. The team rushes down the corridor, away from the security door, and slowly the sound of footsteps can be heard around them. They reach a large door open space in between several hallways and stop to catch their breath. Tap 5 Monreal. I... I don't believe I know how to respond to whatever that was. What was that? Tau 5 Arantu. I have no point. I've never seen anything like it. Tau 5 Anru. There was a human strapped to his head. Did you see it? Tau 5 Nanku. I did. I think it was shouting. I'll likely miss that arm later. Oh wait, pauses. Oh wait, hold on. Pauses a look at the stump of her arm. I'll let him miss that arm later. Tell five run to. He'll be all right. Just be careful. Tell five Nanku. Like I need it anyway. And another. Besides, Nanku swings her shoulder-mounted flamethrower on her left shoulder and detaches it so it hangs down to where a missing arm should be. What was I really gonna use that arm for anyway? Tau 5 Arantu. Noted. Everybody alright? Tau 5 Munru. No worse for wear. Tau 5 Nanku. I'm fine. Tau 5 Anru. I'm alright too. We're here. Look. The team turns to see the hallway to their immediate east, which has bar been barricaded and filled with a substantial amount of explosive and incendiary equipment. Tau 5 Arantu. Good. He approaches the barricade. Hello? This is Tau 5 Arantu. Is anyone there? We're here to get you out. Hello? Silence. Tau 5 Munru. Maybe we're too late. Tau 5 Arantu. We're not, we're not late. Hello, is anyone in there? Can you? There's a shuffling sound and a large wooden crate is moved slightly. A dark face can be seen in the space between the crate and the wall. Tau 5, Monru, last. Tau 5, Arant. Arant, Captain. New connection to local transmitter, transmission network. Zeta 9, Mole Rats, Captain Hollis. Zeta-9 Hollis. Boy, goddamn Power Rangers. Tell me about you. Hollis has surveyed a team. Looks like you were hit. You've been hit with it by a train. Tunnel 5 Munru. Something like that. Zeta-9 Hollis. Well, come on then. We don't have much time left. The team moves towards the opening of the crates as Munru and Nanko pass through. Anru pauses. Arantu notices this and turns to look. Town 5 Anru. Arantu, look. Leeches! Black cracks have been going to form around the walls of the train behind them. Irregular black leeches start to fall out from them. 
accompanied by a thick black liquid. Tap five around two. Pause it. Uh, ah. Addendum 1730.9. Extraction log transcripts. Extraction log transcript. Date redacted. Recovery team, mobile task force, Tau 5, Samsara. Exploration team, mobile task force, Apollo 3, Game Wardens, and mobile task force, Zeta 9, Mole Rats. Sub Subject, SCP-1730. Team Lee, Tau 5, Arantu, Zeta 9, Hollis, AP-3, Ross. Team members, Tau 5 Munru, Tau 5 Anru, Tau 5 Nanku, AP3 Houston, AP3 Vigo, AP3 Ohalo, Zeta 9 Moros, and Zeta 9 Willow. Note the following is an auto, audio and video transcript of the extraction and recovery mission carried out by the members of Tau's Mobile Task Force Tau 5 Samsara. After having made contact with the surviving members of NTF Hollow 3 and at MTF Zeta 9. Aside from the members of the Mole Task Force, the team was tasked with recovering 27 surviving members of Site 13 staff, including Dr. Muhammad Scott, a Site 13 Assistant Director of Temporal Studies. Several of these individuals have sustained significant injuries, further increasing the difficulty of extraction efforts. Members of Mole Task Force Alpha 20, Holy Divers, were stationed above ground and were prepared to move in to aid in instruction efforts once the recovery team has escaped the lower levels of the site. Begin log. Tau 5 Arantu. Mic's on. AP3 Vigo. Are you really worried about recording all this? AP3 Ross. Hey, Vigo, shut the fuck up and do what he says. Zeta 9 Hollis. You're a lady, Power Ranger. Tau 5 Arantu. Thank you. Anru has prepared an evacuation plan. I will let her explain it. Tau 5 Anru. I travel paths from this position are compromised by an entity in the da data center and a creature in the atrium. After speaking with Dr. Scott and his team, we've devised a route that leads us far away from the current major threats as possible. Fortunately, our information on all threats is incomplete. Even Dr. Scott was not privy to information on all contained entities within the site. As such, we should still proceed with caution it with extreme caution. This is likely already well understood. B3 Houston. Yeah, just a bit. Zeta 9 Willow. Alright, so what's the route we're taking? Tau 5 Unru. Our entry maps are here. Uh, oh wait, produces that part graphical map. Our entry routes are here and here. The largest obstacles are experiencing currently are the spatial instabilities within the lower levels of this site. On the suggestion of Dr. Scott and Captain Hollis, our route will travel to the section of the facility where the, thr where the thresher device is contained. This device will cause of the instabilities, and while it's not possible to completely disable the device without the risking of our lives or the lives of, of above ground personnel, we should be able to reduce the power of the device long enough for us to create a stable path to the surface. Following this route here. Zeta 9 Hollis. I got lost shortly after our insertion and ended up in that room. I was attacked by a number of creatures. They were difficult to perceive, like due to some latent anti mimetic effects. I was able to escape them, but there's no doubt they're still there. That machine draws a frankly impossible amount of energy from some energy source elsewhere in the site, and those creatures I saw fed off of it. So there's that. AP, A, AP3 Vigo. Why don't we send a team ahead to disable the machine and then meet up with them before heading up? <coughs> Down 5 or on 2. We will not have enough time, and the probability of our success drops dramatically if we split up our team. Once the device is powered down, 
it is likely that we will have less than an hour to make our escape before it, it trips its fail safes and powers back up again. We will just have to make our push from there. When that it buys us enough time. AP3 Figo. Alright, cool. Tau 5 Arantu. Your assignments are as follows. Tau 5 will take point. Fall 3 will take the right and the left flanks. Zeta 9 will take up the rear. The healthiest survivors will stay near the back. And those with more, more serious injuries will be near the front near Tau 5 in the event that we are flanked or assaulted. Follow the, the typical multi-force defensive assignments while allowing Tau 5 to intercept the higher threats. Tau 5 Munro. Maintain clear lines of communication. Tau 5 and the task force captains have channel priority. Keep chatter to a minimum. You will all have plenty of time to speak once we reach the surface. Zeta 9 Hollis. Our priority now is distracting these people and staying alive. Unless you're in Samsara, in which case, I guess you guys are free to do what, what you want. The rest of us mortals, it doesn't help us to get the Power Rangers get mulched. Since we're likely to shit out of luck if they go belly up. Tau 5 around 2. Agreed. Does everyone understand our mission? All task force members are in agreement. Tau 5 around 2. Acceptable. Then I'll take point. We need to move quickly. Gather your things, prepare the civilians, and we'll leave shortly. Team breaks and assemble in their formation. Civilian survivors are briefed on the mission, plan, and position in the middle of the block. Zeta 9 Willow. Captain, at the main door. There are leashes coming under the door. Zeta 9 Hollis. Shit, Arantu, we need it roll. Tau 5 Arantu. Agreed. Let's move out. Monroe, Naku, collapse the main door. We will exit expediently out the side. Tau 5 Naku. Gladly. The block moves out of the side door towards the side hallway. Tau 5 Naku and Monroe hang back. To set explosive charges around the door frame. Leashes are beginning to work their way under the door frame, and through the cracks in the walls, they st step away from the door. Nanko opens her flamethrower on the leeches. Tau 5 Monru, I cannot say you're making a difference, Nanku. There are likely many more leeches elsewhere. Tau 5 Nanku, this is very satisfying to me. Continues to burn leeches coming through the walls. It is delicious. Monru and Naku move quickly to join the rest of the group, which has begun moving down the, s the side hallways. As they pass through the first door, there is an explosion, and the building random shakes. From beneath the group, a loud, uncanny screaming sound is heard. AP3 Ross. I think they know we're moving. Tau 5 and Rontu. Undoubtedly. The group continues this down a series of hallways. Towards the stairwell, continuing stopping occasionally to check for hostile entities after a short time. Tau 5 Monru calls a halt. Tau 5 Monru. My optics are pinging. Strange. Move everyone back. I'll scout ahead. Tau 5 Monru comes around the corner of the hallway, weapon drawn. His scramble optical implant highlights a dangerous meme on the wall. At the far end of the hallway, a vaguely humanoid entity. The same entity as seen during the previous remote drone exploration of SP-1730 is seen drawn on a wall with a long curvy, curved finger. Monroe projects an image of the entity to Naku, who runs the corner behind Monroe. Tau 5 Monroe, hold. Satellite entity turns towards Monroe and Naku and opens a single white eye, which is immediately Processed and blocked by the scramble units. As it begins to move very quickly down a hallway, changing dramatically as it moves. The entity becomes considerably larger, and its long row flares out from either side, exposing additional hazards that are blocked by the scramble units. Monaro and Naku raise their weapons and fire. The creature reels backwards as it's as it is struck by bullets, with large holes opening across its flesh. Monroe allo reloads, loading incendiary rounds, and fires again, setting the creature on fire as it staggers backwards as he begins to catch madly, scratch madly against the wall to the right, seemingly attempting to dig through the wall away from the gunfire. 
Naruto takes one more shot, striking the entity in its eye, causing it to collapse to the ground. Tau 5, Arantu. Everything alright? Tau 5, Manu. Beer cell, we. Suddenly, the hallway shakes violently. The floor beneath the collapsed humanoid entity crumbles and falls away, revealing a large hole beneath the floor. Within the hole is a long, slick black creature, covered in blood red eyes and a mouth full of many rows of long, sharp teeth. As it bursts through the floor, a cascade of small leeches are propelled into the hallway. The humanoid Humanoid entity slips through the destroyed floor and falls into the mouth of the large creature, which lets out a loud scream as it devours the entity. Long, wet appendages snake into the hallway as Nanku and Monroe begin to retreat. Nanku opens her flamethrower again, warding off the, the approaching smaller leeches. Zeta 9 Hollis. What's going on? Tower 5 Nanku. We all need to find a different route quickly. Top 5, around 2. Follow me. The group moves past the collapsed hallway as Monroe and Nanku provides cover fire. They pass through the custodial dormitory and exit into a maintenance area behind it. Tau 5, Anru. Over there, we can take this path toward the machine. Tau 5, Monroe. We are right... We, we are right behind you. But I'm beginning to think that this creature is far larger than we anticipated. Tau 5, round 2. Onward, take, th take the point. We will move now. Team moves down the long maintenance hallway. The hallway curves to the left, opening out into a large space full of loading equipment and machines. Several large loading docks are visible in the back of the room, though each one is collapsed and destroyed. Zeta 9, Hollis. Round 2, the walls here, here are seeping. We can't stay here long. Tau 5, round 2. One moment. Monru, Naku, how far back are you? Silence. Tau 5, round 2. Monru, Naku, please report. Tau 5, Monru. Round 2. Naku's damage. We're not going to be able to... Gunfire. Round 2 is with you immediately. Monru, do keep us updated on your position. And I'll let you know when we can regroup. Tau 5, around 2. Understood. The group moves to the far end of the maintenance warehouse, exiting through a pair of doors leading to the staff break room. Black fluid seeps through the walls. The group has to stop briefly to bandage up a survivor, whose wound began bleeding again. A loud screeching sound is heard nearby, and the group begins moving again. They enter into another hallway leading in the direction of the thresher wing. As they move for toward the hall, Anru hears a distinct sound. Tau 5, Anru. Arantu. Wings? Tau 5, Arantu. How many? Tau 5, Aran Anru. Many. More than I can count. They are very small, but there's a great multitude of them. Zeta 9, Hollis. You got anything else useful, Power Girl? Tau 5, Anru. A tinkling sound. Crystal on crystal. AP3 Ross. Fuck. Crystal butterflies. It has to be that. We'll get shredded. Tau 5 around 2. Unlikely. The group moves towards the sound, which continues to grow louder. Until it becomes cacophonous and sa sound that seems to be right above them. AP3 Houston. Where is that coming from? Three Ross. Steady now. Stead. Tau 5, Anru. Around to the vent. In front of them, a gra grate of a ceiling vent falls to the floor, and a cloud of sparkling cr crystal butterflies begins to fill the hallway. Anru sees the butterflies and turns back to the group. Tau 5, Around to. Everybody down, please! As the group drops to the ground, Rontu runs towards the cloud of butterflies. He disappears briefly. After a short moment, there is a burst of flame that arcs upward to the vent. The sound of the shattering crystal can be heard above them. As the smoke clears, Rontu becomes visible again. The majority of his flesh has been shredded by the wings of the butterflies, and his entire body is scorched. Significant amounts of flesh hang loose from his body. 
The skin on his back is blackened and blistened, blistered, and a thick metal implement is now visible through the scorched flesh. Anru stands and approaches him. Tap 5 Anru, are you able to continue? Tap 5 Rantu, of course. Tap 5 Houston, Jesus fucking Christ, man, are you alright? Tap 5 Rantu, yes, why wouldn't I be? Grit moves towards another hall, seeping with black fluid, and then another. But the third hallway is clean and relatively untouched. They ascend a short staircase, therefore coming to a stop before a thick vault door. Say the nine Hollis. The machine is behind this door. Come out this way, but the door is sealed behind me. I don't know how to unlock it. Tell five around two. Dr. Scott, do you know how to open this door? Dr. Humat Mohammed Scott. No, I never accessed this chamber. Tell five or Anru. I was hoping Monre would be here. I do not think I can open this door. Suddenly there's a resounding click, and the door in front of them slowly opens. A monitor next to the door illuminates, and the dark room is visible on it. In the back of the room, hidden in shadows, an indistinct humanoid entity waves. Harsh electronic static sound, vaguely reminiscent of laughter, can be heard through an unseen loudspeaker. Unidentified figure. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> oh, oh. As if in pain. Tanny, oh Tanny, it's been so long. Down here with that thunder ship. Tanny, why did you make me hurt? <laughs> oh. Voice fades as the screen is covered in static. The screen powers off. AP3 Ross. That's a pretty fucked up clown. Tau 5 around 2. Come, hurry. The group enters the chamber beyond. The room is very dark with a multitude of dim green lights visible on the walls of the room. Based on the luminescence of the lights and apparent distance of them from each other, the room appears to be several hundred meters in diameter. Near the back of the room, a tower uh, of circling green lights is visible. Zeta 9. Hollis. Hey, Power Rangers. Can you see anything in there? You have dark vision or something, yeah? My visor is shut. Tau 5 around 2. Honor and I were forced to eject our implants after they were damaged by a powerful medic entity. AP3 Ross. My visor works. Hang on. Alright, so there's a some kind of machine near the back of the room. Under those lights. I can't really make any any of it out from here. But it's there. I don't see... Oh shit. Yeah, I do. On the ceiling there. Fuck. There are a lot of those things. Zeta 9 Hollis. What are they? AP3 Ross. Whispering. Honestly, I don't know. I can't make them out. They're definitely fucking with perception. I don't... I don't think they've seen us. Seriously, though. There must be... 500 of these things. Tau 5 Arantu. That would be more than honor and myself can deal with. We need to make a decision. Either attempt to disable a machine without attracting their attention. Or find a way to dispatch the creatures. I am, of course, willing to accept ideas. AP3 Vigo. I mean, we could blow them up. Houston has explosives. It's a, a lot of them to try to get all at once, though. Seda 9 Moros. Hang on. They're feeding on the power of the Stang, aren't they? Why don't we try and get that machine to draw a lot of power to some unnecessary system first? Then shock them. Like fixing like fixing when a mosquito bites you. Tau 5 Anru. Maybe, but it's more likely that... Suddenly, there was a massive disturbance beneath the chamber. To the left of the group, roughly 100 meters away, there's an explosion and the wall falls away. From within the wall emerges a long, slick black appendage covered in red eyes. The eyes open simultaneously. AP3 Houston. There's a screeching sound, and from above them, many hundreds of short imperceptible entities fall from the ceiling. The black entity on the wall begins to lash out at the smaller entities, attempting to pull them in towards its mouth that has, been appear that has appeared on its front. 
The creatures fly towards the larger creature, and begin to tear it at him with his claws. Then many are shoved into the ground, oh, shoved into the open mouth of the creature. Tau 5 are on 2. Huh. That works as well. En route, get to the machine. The rest of you, get back to the hallway. We will, we will not have much time. The group retreats into the hallway outside of the large room. Onward sprints across the chamber as more and more of the smaller entities fall from the ceiling and attack the black creature. Several of them begin moving towards Onru only to be dispatched by weapon fire from Arantu. As she reaches the manual control panel of the machine, Onru inputs the information provided by her members of Dr. Scott's team. Lights around the room illuminate, exposing an enormous, vastly complicated machine that encompasses the entire back wall of the room. More and more of the hostile entities peel off towards Anru, who pause to open fire of the, on those who come too close. From beneath the room, there's another disturbance, and the floor in the middle of the room falls away. Another long black entity emerges, emerges from the hole, and the floor and long tendrils snake out towards Anru. From behind around two comes gunfire. An entire AP-3 team has emerged from the door and begun firing at the entity. The creature recoils, black fluid spilling from gunshot wounds. The tendrils whip around towards them, gripping AP-3 Figo and tossing him into the air. He strikes, he strikes the wall and his body falls to the ground, where, where the f first black entity grabs it with his tendril and pulls it into its mouth. Suddenly, a small black leeches begin to pour from the hole in the floor, and move quickly towards Arantu. Houston and Ohalo open fire on the leeches, and Ross begins. Uh, Ross moves to pull Arantu away from the hole. As he does, he tosses an incendiary grenade into the hole, and pulls Arantu to the ground. There's an explosion, and flame erupts around the black entity, which rears back and flies before collapsing into the hole. From the deep below them, the group can hear a loud screaming sound, and suddenly the entire room is shaking. The other black entity retracts into the, its hole, collapsing the wall behind it as it does. The remaining creatures from the ceiling are dispatched by AP-3 and Zeta-19. As they do, and as the room begins to shake more violently, several lights affixed to the machine in the back move in the back begin to flash and then dim, and the sound of something winding down is heard over the gunfire. AP three Ross God damn it I go fuck Tau five Anru approaches from across the room. Tau five Anru the loss of Figo is disappointing, I am sorry, but we don't have a substantial amount of time to grieve. We must keep moving. Anru, Ross, Houston, Ahalo, and Rontu leave the chamber. More rumbling is felt beneath them, and occasional loud s screeching sounds punk punctuates the machine noise from this section of the facility. They reach a stairwell, and Houston throws the door open. AP3 Houston. Whoa, fuck, what? Now 5 Rontu, what is the matter? AP3 Houston, there's nothing here. The door just opens up into nothing. It's just dark. Far down as I can see. It is likely that disabling the thresher. Oh, wait. Tau 5 Ronru. It's likely that disabling the thresher device has altered our previous escape route. We will need to find another path to the surface. Tau 5 Arantu. Yes, one moment. Monru, where are you? Tau 5 Monru. Difficult to say, unfortunately. Have you powered down the machine? Tau 5. Run to. We just did. Tower 5 runner, fine timing then. We were being pursued by the creature, and then suddenly there was a wall where the creature had been. The local te topography appears to have reset itself. Tower 5 run to. Stay in one place. We will come find you. Our escape plans. Our escape begins now. Tower 5 Munru. Fantastic. Main group leaves the empty stairwell and turns back down the hallway. They they came through, passing by the thresher access the hallway again. 
They turn and begin to climb another staircase. As they reach the top, around two pauses, and the hallway in front of them is covered in ankle height and water. So they're going to move slowly through the water, and one of the researchers behind them screams. Tower 5, round 2, what is it? Researcher. Baddies. Look. Just below the surface of the water, pale humanoid, uh, pale human corpses are visible. They're going to be flowing roughly half a meter down. Tower 5, Anru. Do not attempt to look at them. You do not recognize them. Move quickly. Come on. The team hurries from the hallway towards another set of doors at the end where written on the walls are the words what happened to site 13 and the word what covered by the word Emerson and the words have we become blasphemous beneath that. The group proceeds without incident for a short while longer, slowly ascending as the safe routes become available. After roughly eight minutes of travel, the group enters a large mechanical garage where several pieces of large machinery sit in various states of repair. They pause to secure one of the injured survivors while Anru attempts to devise a new route. Suddenly, a loud banging sound is heard, and a piece of machinery flies across the room, slowly missing AP3 Ross, who shouts, AP3 Ross. Oh, fuck, where did that come from? corner of the room, a stack of mechanical parts is seen moving, rising up and self-assembling into a quasi-humanoid entity. Attached to the top of the large mechanical construct is a small, small, crudely constructed toy robot. The entity begins to move toward them, and a voice is heard from an unknown source within the entity. Mechanical Entity <laughs> I am reborn to breathe devastation upon this petite earth. Pitiful humans, you will feel the dark stain of my never-ending torment. A small robot on top of the con construct is seen waving its, its arms wildly. Tell five around two. This is annoying. Anru, get these people out. Ross, to me. Mechanical Entity. I am the herald of your destruction. Embrace death. Tau 5 are onto an AP3 Houston, but uh, AP3 Ross, Houston, and Ohalo open fire on the entity to little effect. The entity lifts another large piece of equipment and throws it, the, it toward, the, toward the group, missing them, missing them wide. Ohalo throws a fragmentary grenade at, at the entity, which it catches in one of its outstretched hands and grips it tightly. The grenade explodes, shattering the creature's hand, causing it to stagger sideways. Mechanical entity, how dare you? I will tread upon you like. Tau 5 Anru has been sprinting towards the entity. As she approaches it, she leaps into the air, sailing on top of it in a tall arc. She reaches on the top of the arc. Uh, she reaches out and grabs a small toy robot on top of the construct, causing it to collapse. As she flips towards the ground, she tosses the robot towards the wall. Robot. Robot. No, I am the Harbinger. I am. The toy robot strikes the wall and it is shattered. Tau 5, Monru. Around 2, is that you? We just heard something crashing. Tau 5, Around 2, you must be near. Stay where you are. We're, we are in route. The group moves out of the garage and towards a large atrium sec section. From around the, the corner came Tau 5, Monru, and Nanku. Monru appears to have sustained burns to his lower body, but is otherwise undamaged. Nanku is missing the lower half of her jaw, and the black fluid covers the front of her bodysuit. She waves with her remaining hand as the group approaches. Tau 5, Monru. You look well. Tau 5, Monru. Immediately, Morale has decreased in the group since Naku found herself unable to talk. Tau 5 Naku points at Monru with her flamethrower, seemingly forgetting she is missing an arm on that side. Realizing this, she makes an obscene gesture towards Monru with her, her remaining hand. 
Seda 9 Hollis. This is a cute reunion. We need to get back to this shit. How far are we from the entrance? Tower 5. Tower 5 Monroe. This is the main atrium. If we follow this all the way here, it will lead towards the processing station. Past that, we should find access points to the surface. Seda 9 Hollis. Exceptional. Let's get, get the lead at then and... Below them, there's a loud crashing sound and more screaming. More beneath the ground begins to buckle. Seda 9 Hollis. Fuck. Run! The group flees towards the hallway. Monroe had identified. But are stopped when the floor uh, there also collapsed. A plume of smoke erupts from the destroyed floor, and one researcher slips on the collapsing ground and slides into it. Tau 5 Anru leads the group away from the atrium as the floor there completely collapses. A run to stops to turn and look down inside the hole. Beneath the hole is an incredibly large chamber, appearing to have been dug through dozens of layers of subterranean floors. Within the chamber are many small lights around. The outside at the bottom is a massive black mass with several other large black masses extending from it. As he pulled away, Runtus sees red eyes across, uh, red eyes open across the entire mass of the creature, and he hears more screaming. The group flees down the side hallway, but are pursued by a long black tendril sneaking out of the hole. AP-3 Ross and Houston open fire on the tendrils, halting them momentarily, but they are quickly replaced by more. Theta-9 Moros has been slipping on a patch of black fluid and falling before being consumed by the ends of one of the tendrils. There are the sounds of metal crashing the ground and concrete being crushed as the structure around them heaves violently. Black leeches begin to pour out of the walls around them, and Naku opens her flamethrower at them. They round a corner and find a dead end, and turning back are confined with a large black tendril that has burst through a hole in the wall. AP-3 Ohalo. Holy fuck, we're trapped. This is it, this is it. Holy fuck. Tell 5 around to. Anru, we need another way out. Tell 5 Anru, I... I am having difficulty. I... I... Can, I stay to 9 Hollis. Wait, wait, I have an idea. I think I know where we are. I have an idea. Come on, you fuckers. We're not dying here. The group follows Hollis towards the descending stairwell. And moves quickly down it. Tosses an extendary grenade towards the encroaching tendrils. It smashes the door shut behind her as it explodes. Screams from down below them intensifies as they descend the stairwell. Begins to shake. Holes in the stairwell open and more leeches begin to pour out of them. As task force members open fire, as long as tendrils sneak through the holes as well, upon reaching the landing, Hollis mentions the group in the door. Seda 9 Hollis. Here and here. Go, go, go. The group enters a hallway and sprints towards the other end as they do. They pass a sign on the wall that reads, Stare the Chir Chironics. Monroe notices this as they pass. Tell 5 Monroe, Captain Hollis, what are you doing? Seda 9 Hollis. You're gonna have to trust me here, Brother Ranger, but I've been doing this for a long time. Tell 5 Munro. I... <laughs> okay, I think this'll work. Tell 5 exits the hallway to a large observation section, and I see many large section windows, with blast protectors down across them. The team stops in front of one window, overlooking a massive chamber lined with st huge steel doors. Overhead are woods... Words, Olympia Class Testing Observation. Tell 5, Arantu. Hollis, what do you have in mind? Seda 9, Hollis. Call it a hunch. We need to get downstairs. Come on. There's a group. The group runs towards the stairwell at the end of the room and quickly descends to the main level of this wing. As they exit onto the floor of the Olympia, Cla Olympia Class Containment Chamber. The walls behind them begin to buckle, and leeches begin to pour out of it. Seda 9 Hollis, P-3 
pink ranger, that panel over there. You need to get that door open. Top 500. Wh what? Say the night, Hollis. I said open the goddamn door. Hurry. What the fuck are you waiting for? Go. Top 500 runs towards the control panel near one of the tall steel doors. The wall behind them continues to buckle. Say the nine, Hollis. Monroe, that one. Get that one open, open too. Town 5 Monroe. Yes, absolutely. Town 5 Monroe attempts to access the door controls. Say the nine, Hollis. Turns towards the group. Say the nine, Hollis. Everyone else, listen to me. You civilians need to get us. Get to the far end of this room as far as it goes. Just keep running. There's an access point to the power station above this part of the facility. You just need to keep climbing until you get there. Once you're there, you need to blow a wall that will get you out. But you need to hurry. Shit is about to pop off in a, in a pretty major way down here. Ross, you and your boys just fire at anything that comes out, comes, comes out of that wall. I'll tell you when we can go. Ratu, you stay with me. This is going to get pretty messy. Top 5 run to. Understood. Say to 9 Hollis. Alrighty. Alright. Fucking go. Come on. The group flees down the main pathway through the chamber away from the buckling wall. Behind them, the wall finally gives way. And a gargantuan black slick entity pours into the chamber. It's at least 200 meters in height, covered in black tendrils and dark red eyes. When it sees the group, it opens a map. A massive mouth full of rows of long yellow teeth. In the center of the mouth, a naked human woman is visible, conjoined in some way in a sort of prehensile tongue with the, with the creature. As it opens its mouth, it lets out a piercing scream and begins to move towards the group. Every available task force member opens fire on the creature, emptying their remaining magazines and throwing every possible incendiary weapon towards it. The creature is deterred slightly, but for every place it is pierced by weapons. Fire, black liquid, and more black leeches begin to pour from its body. Several long tendrils begin to sneak towards the group of task force members. Tau 5, Anru. I have it. I have it. Captain Hollis. Sit in nine. Hollis. Come on, dang girl. Throw the fucking thing. Tau 5, Anru steps from the control panel and runs back towards the group of the middle. The chamber, as loud as the groaning is heard behind her. The sense of team sees huge metal doors begin to slide open. A thick cloud of ice cold fog grows out of the chamber, obscuring the interior from view. AP3 Ross. What's in there? Zeta 9 Hoss. Monroe, you got yours? Tower 5 Monroe. Hang on. Yeah, I think that'll do. Suddenly, the door behind Monroe begins to glow bright red, then white. Then the center of it buckles and the door collapses. As Monroe hurries away from the colossal, motionless, flaming humanoid, Entity floats out of the chamber. In its unmoving hands it is a huge sword. As it exits the collapsed doorway, enormous flaming wings unfurl from its back. Black creature screams and its tendrils begin to lash at this creature. As the tendrils come close, long streaks of fire erupt from the sword towards them. Rupturing them and sending, them, sending black fluid and scorched leeches flying across the room. The massive black creature screams and dozens of other tendrils fly towards the flaming humanoid. As the two engage, there's another sound, a long whining, and then suddenly the room is silent. From within the cold, foggy room, a towering, vaguely servine creature steps out into the main chamber. It's composed of a body covered in light green and cr cream colored hair, a long thick neck ending in a hairless, somewhat humanoid face, and vast intertwined white and black antlers that pulse with shrinks of blue light. Floating above its head are nine concentric rings of glowing rotating crystals and metallic spheres. The creature slowly steps out of the containment cell and turns to to look at the team on the ground below. It opens its mouth and a long droning sound is heard through the room. Around its body, several large metallic cylindrical structures appear, followed by a distinct cracking sound. It begins to step towards the team of task force members, but is stuck between but is stuck from behind 
by three black tendrils that wrap around his neck. The creature lets out another drone, and suddenly the sound returns to this chamber as long streaks of fire arc across the space. The central constructs turn lengthwise and speed across the room towards the black creature, striking it in its central mass. From all around the servine entity, more and more metallic spheres appear and fly towards both the black creature and the flaming humanoid, which in turn begin to attack each other. City Nine Hollis, fucking yes. Go get him, big guy. To the team. Time to fucking go, kids. Let's go. The team begins to sprint after the group of civilians towards the far wall as jets of fire strike the ground around them. Tau 5, Naku, reach, catches the end of the dismembered black tendril in her shoulder, throwing her off balance. She falls to the ground, firing open, openly with her weapon. She is engulfed in fire. AP3 Houston pauses briefly to turn towards her, but is grabbed by Arantu. Tau 5, Arantu. We do not have time. As they near the group of survivors, all of whom are huddled near the exit door at the end of the chamber, there is a crashing sound as they turn to see the servine entity standing up from where it had been thrown across the room. The black creature whips at it as more metallic spheres appear at the arc back towards it. There's an eruption of fire as flaming humanoid is struck by another several tendrils, which try to pull the humanoid towards the mouth of the black entity. The team reaches the survivors and quickly exits through the door. The group begins to quickly ascend the staircase within. Zeta 9 Hollis. Alright, just like I said, up. We need to go up. Over. A long, thin electrical cylinder crashes through the wall of the stairwell, narrowly missing one of the researchers and Dr. Scott. A second cylinder comes through the wall, striking around to and blurring him as it contacts the wall behind him. As the group continues to ascend, the fire fills the stairwell below them, and another long, loud droning sound can be heard, followed by silence and then followed by a thick, bursting sound that shakes the entire facility. The group reaches a landing and begins to move towards another staircase at the end of the hallway. Zeta 9 Hollis hangs behind. Tau 5 Monroe. What are you doing? Zeta 9 Hollis. Give me some time and something else. I think, get these people out of here. Go! Tau, f Tau 5 Monroe. I can stay behind. Hollis, your life is finite. Zeta 9 Hollis. Yeah, yeah, I get the spell, spell Power Ranger. But right now, you need to get these people out of here. Let me do my thing, alright? I'll catch up with you later. Tau 5 Monroe, I understand. Good looking out, Hollis. Zeta 9 Hollis. <laughs> you almost sound like a person there for a second, Munru. Zeta 9 Hollis runs aw away from the group. Ta Tau 5 Munru catches up with the rest of the group, who reach another staircase and begin to ascend. For the next 10 minutes, the group continues to ascend through the facility, several times narrowly avoiding debris and falling rumble as the lower levels of the site begin to cla uh, collapse. The sounds of these entities below continue to be heard several times as the, cre the creatures become visible through the large gaps of the in the walls or floors. At one point, AP3 Ross catches sight of an unmoving flamino humanoid, nearly completely covered in metal, as long streaks of fire burst through the open seams in the casement. Shortly afterwards, there is a two-minute break in all foot video footage, following by a shot of the head of a servine creature crashing smashing through a wall in front of the group as they turn to run away from it the head towards them two researchers are instantly transmuted in a hexagonal columns and of unknown yellow green material after a short time longer ap3 ross picks up the, a signal from site command site command team lead this is site command do you read us ap3 ross holy fuck yes yeah i do do you hear me Site command, we do. We have... We do. You have appeared on our geolocating systems. Frost, you're not far from the exit. Where is Captain Hollis and Aruntu? AP3 Hollis. Aruntu is dead. Hollis, she ran off a while back. 
We haven't seen her since then. Psych command understood. What about the rest? AP3 Hall. Uh, AP3 Ross. We suffered some casualties, some... Gunfire. Fuck. We lost a few of the civilians, and Vigo, and a few others. It's really bad in here right now. Command, we're gonna need all the help we can get. We... Munru, where's Anru? Tower 5, Munru. She... Oh, she was behind us. Where is she? Say, Command, don't worry about that now. We're marking an extraction point on your visor. The extraction team is waiting for you there. We're gonna get you all out. The group hurries towards the extraction point as the site continues to collapse around them. Above ground aerial surveillance captures footage of a large of large sections of the site sliding into the ground. Smoke beginning to billow from them from the power station and nearby mechanical facilities. Just a flame becomes visible as Earth beneath SCP-1730 begins to give way. Mobile Task Force Alpha-20 Holy Divers enters the site near the crumbling power station. A group of survivors comes into view and are immediately moved towards the access point and then away from the site by members of MTF-A-20. As the rest of the task force members are pulled away from the site, several transmission reaches site command, originating from Tau-5 Anru. Tau-5 Anru and Zeta-9 Hollis are standing in front of the Thresher device, which roars with activity behind them. They are firing their weapons at an encroaching black mass in front of them, which is punctured by streaks of fire. In the background, the Servine entity can be seen we see him tearing through the black tendrils with his antlers. As long rods of flame metal streak across the room towards the black entity, Hollis, Hollis turns towards the camera and is essentially laughing, firing her weapon openly. She has removed her helmet. The hum of the machine behind them gr grows noticeably louder, eventually overtaking all other sounds in the room. Shrieks of electricity arc across the ceiling above them. She smiles and turns towards Anru. He looks down to find her torso has been destroyed by a jet of flame. As Unruh slumps to the side, the last shot of a Zeta-9 Hollis laughing hysterically and wildly firing her weapon as an enormous machine behind her begins to glow bright white. There is a flash and the transmission ends. Outside is an MTF A-20. Continues to move. 1370 researchers and personnel to safety. There is a def deafening crackling sound and a loud, loud hum fills the air. The area around the site begins to visibly distort as if being seen through the water and then suddenly SCP-1730 is gone. In this place is an immense, immense crater over one kilometer in diameter. No other transmissions are received from within the site. No other anomalous activity is detected. End log. And that's it of SCP-1730, uh, uh, expression logs from, you know, Samsara. Yeah, it was long, fuck. <laughs> it was so long. To be fair, that's not the longest SCP story, but that is a really good one. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I do have to think that'll probably be my last story of tonight. I'm yeah, getting tired. Alright. Well, like, you went with a bang. Yeah, like I think it took you 90 minutes to read it. Damn. I didn't you realize. No, not that's the fans. Actually, not that uh, scene. That's actually pretty fast. All right, I hydrated, bookworm. All right. Oh, I actually put intermission scene. It's... <laughs> so they put intermission scene instead of ending scene.
<laughs> Anyways, bookworm, last words go. While Bookworm's preparing her last words, go ahead and do your last words, Teary. Mm. Just remember, if you see any buildings from an old family, make sure there's not any murderous children. Oh my god. <laughs> Too soon? No. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I, um, Bookworm got surprised about the factory. Oh, you already read the factory. Bookworm yeah, was able to... didn't know about it? No, they did not. <laughs> I thought that was always one of the first stories I read about the SCG universe. Yeah. To remember what <laughs> thanks yeah like <laughs> it put <worked> for <laughs> messaging about it say they're a little off guard but yeah um if I knew about the factory you're for I must have forgot fire red emblem ask me like, comment, subscribe, and follow Bright Oh my god. SCP scary A lot show. of SCP. Give her money if you can. Oh. So she can separate herself from the horrors of capitalism. Sounds like the great Dirt Bright's got quite the entertaining setup going on there. Does it just see it? Is so the dollar you see it? Wait. Wait. <laughs> what is the bot saying? Nine feet of stadium. If you look at your screen, you can see what they're saying. No, it's like it's and it's, it's, it's speaking in another language. And now it's just saying the letter A repeatedly. <laughs> oh <laughs> there's nothing tougher than a Ford truck. Ford tough. Well, it sounds like a different language. <laughs> what? Well, I guess is dying, but at least the, the text is working. Yeah, but for, for once, instead of me breaking things, you broke it. <laughs> you know what? Maybe it was leechable. Huh. Humans one, AI zero. <laughs> yeah, there's actually. Um, there's actually a note, but no one I want to raid tonight, so we're just gonna end stream tonight. And honestly, I did stream. Like, I kind of want to do like six hours to eight hour streams, and at six hours and forty two minutes. So, I did good. <laughs> that was very long. Yeah, it was. Why would you want to do that long? Most people don't. Oh yeah, I forgot. You eat dinner early because you eat lunch early because you eat breakfast early. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, Danger Noodles, I I hope you enjoyed. I will see you guys next time for your next mission, and, uh, vibrating cactus butt plugs. No! <laughs>